السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد I first want to start by thanking FAMZI for their invitation and thank everybody I know that everyone here could have been somewhere else playing with your kids or taking them out or uh, doing something that you would love to do hosting people or uh, doing some activities I believe that uh, our coming together today for the sake of our children to enable us to raise our children as Muslims in the West is a, a, a show of commitment and I hope that uh, this message will go beyond this room that our commitment to our children is uh, endless and limitless because this is how we bring a better next generation. You look back at the way you were raised and you see the impact of this on your current life. Uh, those of us who wake up at Fajr are the byproduct of parents who did the effort to wake them up at Fajr time. Uh, those of us who are finding it difficult to wake except for the work time, they know that because parents woke them up when it was school time only. So whatever we do with our children today is going to impact how they behave as adults. The, uh, the purpose of these presentations, uh, first uh, is the first presentation about the rights of children in Islam, is to give us a context. Muslim scholars uh, and jurists have said that judging any matter depends on the perception of that matter. So the way we perceive our children influences how we deal with our children. So the purpose of the first session is to get our perceptions to be consistent with what Islam intends for us as parents. To, to be consistent means how does Islam look at children and how does Islam want parents to look at children. In that regard, it will help us uh, in getting the right context for how to understand our children. The second session will give us uh, a glimpse, a very quick glimpse of how the environment impacts our children because we are struggling with an adversary environment that has different values, different objectives of raising children to comply and conform to the social and political norms. So if we agree with what's out there, then we don't need to look at an alternative. But if we don't, then we have to establish what is the alternative for this environment. So understanding how the environment influences our kids is vital for parents. You send your kids to the school, even a Muslim school, is going to impact them negatively. Not because it's bad, not because teachers are bad, but because it is the nature of the beast. You send your kid somewhere, he or she is going to pick some habits that you would not agree to. So you have to set up your own limits at home. The third session will address uh, a very important issue for us. How do we understand youth as an age group? When they turn into teenagers and everybody is puzzled, as if this is you know, a strange animal coming at home. Uh, we have to look at teenagers as, as an age group and pinpoint what characteristics do they have, what, what makes them tick, what makes them afraid or concerned, why do they get into seclusion at times, they don't want to deal with anybody, why aren't they willing to go out with you to your neighbors or friends and stuff like this. So we need to understand youth as an age group. Then the final session will give us some uh, parental tips, about 30 tips, and I believe they are very important. How to deal with our youth in particular, building on the knowledge we had in the previous three sessions. This is our program for today. If there is any question about the sequence or the topics, this is the time to ask. Yeah, I will bring the slideshow now. But any question about the, the topics or the sequence, any concern that you want us to address, you can take notes. And we will try to allow time. I timed myself so that uh, I will be under the control of the plan uh, of the program. Uh, first of all, uh, we have to look at children through our own look to ourselves when we were young. When we were young, uh, many of us would remember that we were also uh, weak and needy. We needed somebody to care for us. And as much as children become nuisance and when they scream, when it, they don't, you don't know what they want, when they 
are just screaming for nothing or they don't want to sleep at the time you want them to sleep, they don't want to eat what you want them to eat. Uh, these are by nature the weakness of being a child. And the child comes with that weakness because it's through you, the parent, that he starts to get some strength. Strength of knowledge, strength of will, something extremely important that we will talk about frequently today, that their will is weak. And what, what is the weakness in their will? They know what is right, as, as much as we are also weak, we know what is right, but we do what is wrong sometimes, right? Children have a, a, a period uh, and an allowance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be wrong for much longer time than we adults. So we have to look at those issues. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarizes this. Allah is the one who created you from weakness, then made strength after weakness, then made weakness and aging after strength. So Allah is telling us it goes full circle. You start weak, you gain strength, and then you become an elderly parent, then you go back to weakness. You need somebody again to care for you and so on and so forth. And as much as people quote the Quran, guiding you know kids and stuff to be kind to their parents, وَقَدَ رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا and so on and so forth, we need to look at the ahadith that talks to parents as to how to cultivate this kindness from young age with the children. And uh, this is one of the least quote, quoted hadith in that regard is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he says, uh, Be kind, courteous, and respectful to your parents so that your kids will be also kind and respectful to you. Children come in packages. Everyone is a unique package. Every one of the children is a unique separate package. But they are to be regarded, and this is building our context now. They are humans. We'll talk about this. Why do we emphasize the fact that they are humans? We know it doesn't take a genius to know they are humans. But we'll talk about this. They are also a trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them to us to, to consider them as such. We don't own children. If, if you have a trust, it's not yours. You say, my child, but in fact, it, he is the creation of Allah and a gift to you. He is a trust, he is a gift, he is also a test. And we'll talk about children being a test for parents as much as also parents are a test for the children. Uh, they come, each one of them, with their own uh, neutral inclinations. Uh, inclination to goodness, inclination to evil, inclination to wickedness, inclination to be straightforward. This is built in every human being. Also, they are childish. They are going to do childish stuff. So you have to open your heart and mind to accept this fact. Uh, they are also equally your children. You have to be just. You have to be fair. And you have to recognize what is fair in their mind is not necessarily what you, the adult, regard as fair. So fairness is a relative concept between adults and children. And they are also uniquely different. Every one of them is a unique human being. There is none of them is going to be like the other. So you don't measure them against each other. As far as emphasizing the fact that they are humans, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that every newborn is born with the fitrah, the inclination to be a Muslim. And that seed is implanted in the heart and the soul of the child as he gets born, as he gets created, it is planted. You read in Surah Al-A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us that uh, before He had created us, He has taken the seeds from the backs of our parents and challenged everyone and said, أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَى وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَى This is a total recognition. Then we ignite that seed when the child is received by starting to inculcate Islam. We'll talk about this in a minute. So every newborn comes with that fitrah to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then parents are the ones who either nurture it or reverse it or change it to something different. So in essence, the Prophet is saying, it is you, <laughs> nothing but you, no one but you, who can turn their kids to be Muslims, good Muslims, or fringe Muslims, or true Muslims, whatever the title is, or Christians, or Jews. 
You put them in an environment, you take responsibility for that environment. You put them through an education system, you take the results as they come. So the Quran also says the same thing. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, protect yourselves and your children or your family against what? Hellfire. If it were not in our hands, if the key were not in our hands, Allah wouldn't have instructed us and charged us to hold the key to paradise. You're holding the key to their destiny. The Quran is saying, protect them, protect yourself, which means the key is in our hands. There is a lot of misconceptions, even with us adults, thinking that going to paradise is not guaranteed. You know, nobody knows, you know, nobody can guarantee. But that runs exactly against us and our faith in the promises of Allah. Allah said, if you believe, if you do righteous works, you promise paradise. Why do we doubt it? Why do we act as if we don't trust that promise and say, Allah will decide, nobody knows. Indeed, it is by the grace of Allah, but that grace is not given randomly. Allah says, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسَعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ فَسَأَكْتُبُهَا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا I will, my, my mercy encompasses everything. But I will designate it to those who believe, do righteous deeds, and follow the unlettered Prophet ﷺ. So there is a clear promise that we have to accept. And we have to take that responsibility that the destiny of our children, likewise our own, is in our hands. As how much we believe and how much we turn this belief into action. So as a trust, Allah has the power to tell us what to do with our children. Because he's the owner, he is the creator. So he tells us, he instructs us concerning our children, يُوصِيكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي أَوْلَادِكُمْ And then it goes on to amaze all of us, لِلذَّكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظِّ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ We think when Allah says that he's advising us, admonishing us, that he will say, treat the male and the female alike in everything. That's our judgment. But because he has a system that is different than our imagination, and he has the power and the ownership of all of us, he tells us how to deal with his trust. This is a trust. So if he has the power to create, he has the power to tell us how to deal with our children. Also, the Prophet ﷺ was once talking with uh, his companions, and he told them that whosoever has three daughters, and he cares for them and raises them as Muslims, until they get married, they will act like a protecting fence between the parent and hellfire. So a smart Muslim woman standing by said, she only had two. So she said, how about two, O Prophet? And the Prophet said, and two, with natain. Then another one said, she only had one, she said, how about one? He said, even one. Why does he emphasize daughters? Why didn't he say, if you have a child? Because daughters, the mothers, are given a very special responsibility. That is, they are more patient, more compassionate, more loving, more emotionally engaged. And that's why they are entrusted with the biggest responsibility on earth, to raise men and women under their care. So mothers are to be protected. And that's why there's a lot of care given in Islam as a system to care for the daughters, to care for the mothers, and so on and so forth. And that's why, by the way, it is in Islam the only system on earth that gives the mother the right not to seek to earn their own living. You are a mother, you, you provide it for. You don't have to seek your living. You don't have to work, why? You have to care for a child or two or more. Until they get out of the home, your full-time job, the best job you can do for humanity is to give full attention, full-time job. If, if any of you are mothers here, you know what the word full-time job means. You know, when you get a, a new baby and uh, the night turns day and the day turns night sometimes, if you have any night, and uh, it's more than a full-time job. So Islam says mothers are always to be provided for no matter what. Even if the husband is very poor, the society should pitch in to help the mother stay home with the kids. Kids as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran says, Allah uh, الذي جعل لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا وجعل لكم من أزواجكم بنين وحفدة ورزقكم من الطيبات. Literal uh, concept here is that it is Allah who gives you whatever He gives you. 
Allah gives you a spouse, gives you children, He provides for you. This is the, the, the package of uh, the, the, the fadl that Allah provides, the gift and the bounties that Allah provides for all of us. Which means what? That kids are being given. It's a gift from Allah. Also, you hear uh, in the next verse also, Allah subhanahu wa telling us that يَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ إِنَاثًا وَيَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ الذكور أو يزوجهم ذكرانا وإناثا ويجعل من يشاء عقيمة It is Allah's decision All of it He gives you a boy or a girl or a mix thereof or he may make some uh, infertile altogether they beget no children or the other option is he makes somebody infertile for 10-15 years and then they can beget children So it's all in the hands of Allah It's a gift literal gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you look at your child as a human being, uh, you will not handle him as, as, as you handle a seat. When you know that your child is not owned by you, you know that it's a trust, you keep, you protect, you nurture, you develop. When you know that your child is a gift, from whom? From Allah, you embrace that child, you give him compassion, love and care, much more than anything else. And instead of looking at children as, you know, uh, undesirable evil or kids are nuisance and they are always this. I have no patience, I have no spirit, this is too much for me because my husband doesn't help, he's not. No, if you embrace a child, your mission will become easier and Allah will help. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help. So as a gift, we look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to provide that support needed. But also children are a test, <laughs> like everything else in life. The entire life, we are here to be tested. We always like to quote that we are here to worship Allah, but Allah also reminded us in Surah Tabarak that we are also here to be tested. You know, الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم to test you. And what what is the way to test? The Quran mentions several ways. You can be tested by being wealthy, or poor, sick, or healthy, or a neighbor to a healthy person or a sick person when you have the opposite situation. You can be tested by this also. You can be tested by having children or not having children, by having only boys or only girls, or a mix thereof, or one or two, or five or ten. You are going to be tested one way or the other. Uh, your wealth and children are but a test. It's a matter of looking at this, which means what? You have to be caution. You know, you have to be cautious that uh, you don't take your kids for granted. I'm raising them, they are my kids. Uh, you have to be cautious. Indeed, some of your wealth and your children are a test. Beware of it. Huh? You have to be careful that some of your, like the child of Noah, he turned against his dad, right? Uh, some of the spouses, like the wife of Lut, uh, the wife of uh, Noah they also turn to be a test for the husbands. So this is one major way of being tested within the family and within our own uh, small connections. Also kids uh, and every human being, they come with their own uh, neutral neutral inclinations. Uh, the Quran says, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا give, give it its natural essence and then فَأَلْهَمَهَا inspired it with its wickedness and righteousness. All embodied in the creation of the human being. So you can call on to the good nature of the child and inspire that and grow it and nurture it. And you can call on the wicked nature of the child. And most of the children when cornered, they don't come righteous. <laughs> they come with that bad side. So you have to be careful how do you deal with your kids. You know, we're always badgering children. You have to do this, you didn't do this. In fact, one of the most uh, prevalent flaws in, in raising our children is that we do not talk with our children enough. And when we do, it is always, almost in the shade of a crisis. You know, he has to do something go good, very excellent, or something extremely awful to get you to talk to him or her. Why? Because you don't have time. And we're not really raising children. Children grow on their own. Right? 
they, they grow on their own. You provide food like chicken. You provide them with something, they grow, right? You give them clothes, you are not catching cold or something like this. But then, if you want to raise children, you have to ask, when do we do that? When do, what activities do I do to raise my children as Muslims now? Is it by just calling them to pray? This is an assignment. They get it behind their back, it's finished, right? Dad, I prayed. Dad, I memorized 10 verses. Dad, I finished Qulu Allah Ahad. And then dad is happy. But is this what raising a child is about? This is something that we'll have to talk about a lot here today. So uh, this verse also tells us that it is the parents who take responsibility of nurturing the good nature in the child. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا How do I purify tazkiyah? What is tazkiyah? How do you uh, do the tazkiyah process with the child? The child is, I can, I can show you something. If you get a new piece of white cloth that you buy, and then you wear it, let us say it is the prayer cloth or the jilbab that you wear, right? Then you use it one, two, three, four times, and then you look at it, it's not as white as it was. What, what happens? It picks stuff from the environment. How do you clean it, right? You just don't dust it, right? Put it through the washing machine, the dryer, you put cleanser, right? So we have to know, as much as we spend time cleansing their clothes, their soul has to be cleansed. Their hearts have to be cleansed. As much as we feed the body, we have to also feed the mind and feed the soul. These are the essence of what a human being is. You know, what makes us humans really is the soul. Uh, because the body comes from earth and it goes to earth, it vanishes. But what stays to be the, the central element of us being human is what? It is a soul. And the soul comes from where? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to nurture the soul. And we can talk about this also as we move forward. So we have to focus on nurturing, purifying, inculcating values at young age with our children. By the way, you don't need to write anything on the screen. You have the handout. If you don't, can give you electronic copy of the whole thing. But you can write your own notes of whatever you hear. Also, children are bound to be child. So you have to be open-minded enough to recognize and distinguish and sort their behavior. What is typically acceptable from a child, and you overlook this. And what is unacceptable, then you pay attention to it and fix it. But giving everything one and the same attention, one and the same direction, confuses you as a parent, but much worse, it confuses a child. Because you wouldn't know what is serious for you. What is your priority then? You know, kids are, for example, laughing and playing together. It's childish, but they will do it. They will kick each other, they will push each other, they will snatch things from each other. That's childish, right? But is it acceptable as a habit? No, it is not. So you address it in that context. It is, yes, childish, but it is unacceptable to say as a habit in the long run. So you address it in that context, right? But when it turns, for example, that you see one of your children, you know, holding a match and trying to fire something, that is not really child play. This is something serious. And he has to know that this is much more serious than picking the toy from his brother or snatching it from his hands. These are two different things, okay? So you have to be able to distinguish what is child and what is not. We know the story of the Prophet ﷺ when he was praying and one of his grandchildren, you know, climbed his back and he stayed in prostration for a long time. So they asked him, why did you take long to come up from prostration? And he said, what? That's what he said. He said, one of my grandkids climbed my back and I didn't want to dislodge him before he's finished. Come on. If the back of the Prophet is good for his grandchildren, why aren't our backs good for our own children? Why aren't we patient? You see a child coming and he disturbs you a little bit in the prayer. Why do you push him hard? Why don't you embrace him and grab him by the hand, let him or her stand next to you? Why don't we exercise some patience with our children? It's because our perception of children is that we have boundaries and they have boundaries. 
The Prophet is telling us, no, 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 your back is good for your child. And one day, Abu Bakr Siddiq entered, and one of the kids were riding, in fact, two of them were riding on the back of the Prophet, and he was walking on his hands and knees when they took him for a ride. And Abu Bakr looked at them and said, do you know what? Ni'ma al Huh? No, he said, al-awal al-alayhi huwa ala Rasulullah sallam, ni'ma al-jamalu jamalukuma, the best of camels anybody could ride is the camel that you're riding, referring to the Prophet in, in, in a funny way. And the Prophet sallam said, wala ni'ma al-farisani antuma, and you are the best of horseback riders. This is, this is a, a way that gives us a, a fresh look at what children and parents ought to be doing and ought to be like in the relationship. And by the way, that talks about the back of men much more than the back of women. And I want, I want to make sure, I want to make sure that our brothers' backs are really solid enough to carry some of this responsibility. Because everything I hear from our sisters is the, pair, the fathers are not available. And this is serious. It damages your ability to build relationship with your child. It damages your ability to uh, transform the life of the child to become an adult in your image, if you will. And it damages your ability to connect with the child as he grows older to become your friend, your brother, your counselor, your advisor, and your right-hand man as they grow older. Okay, child, they are. Again, equally your children. The Prophet Sallallahu says, Fear Allah and be fair to all of your children. Uh, some of us think that to be fair means I give everybody one and the same thing. Yes, that is true. But only in basic essentials. You have to give everybody the same. So you go out to buy the eight clothes, everybody has to get something complementary or comparable to each other. But when someone excels in the school or memorizes a chapter in the Quran and the other does not, you don't give everybody the same thing. You have to reward those who do better so that others can be encouraged. Likewise, uh, when, when one of them does something bad, you don't go around everybody else to punish the rest of the gang, right? You have to distinguish who's doing good, who's not. So in punishment and reward, you have to be specific, okay? But in basic necessities, food, education, clothing, basic gifts that comes on occasions, you have to be fair to give everybody almost the same. And I'm uh, throwing here a picture of a birthday party just to tell you that uh, uh, when you celebrate something for someone, you also have to do the same for everybody. That is not to say that I'm supporting birthday parties in, 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 a, in a way, but just to give you the occasion. If you reward somebody for excelling academically, everyone who excels ought to be rewarded. And if anyone else doesn't excel, you reward them relatively for improvement so that everybody gets something for the effort they put forth. Okay. But equ being equally your children doesn't necessarily that they are mean that they are all the same. They continue to be differently unique. Every one of them comes with their own emotions, temperaments, and what they like, what they don't, what works, what doesn't. Uh, some of them work with temptation, some work with pressure, some work by organization and scheduling, some work by reward and punishment, uh, some work by conditioning. So you have to figure out a way what works with every, every child that you have? Boys are different than girls, uh, younger are different than old, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know how Prophet uh, Yaqub uh, was talking to his son Yusuf, telling him, don't you tell your brothers about your dream, lest envy kicks in and the shaitan turns them against you, uh, and they will plot and plan things against you. That is a, a, a good recognition of a parent who knows that some of the children are not as decent as they should be. So he takes one on the side and says, be careful. They are your brothers, 
but be careful, don't tell them everything that you have. So one has to recognize, if one of the children, for example, got caught, he went to high school or college, and he got caught in a gang, right? You have to protect the rest of the children, okay? You have to protect the rest. You don't say, but he is their brother or she is their sister. You have to protect the ones that are not yet influenced negatively by whatever is out there in the society. Also, Nuh, a story that many Muslims abuse, in fact, by, by quoting the story, many say, if Nuh couldn't get his son to be guided, how good am I more than a prophet? But listen to the story of Nuh, you will find something very amazing. We know that Nuh went making da'wah with his people for how many years? 950, 950 almost a thousand years. So, if his son was the, the youngest baby, I would imagine that by the time they were riding the ark, that guy was about 700 years old, right? So, so if, if this baby has been given the advice for 700 years, Noah never gave up on him. And this is a lesson that we have to learn. Noah never gave up on his son until the last minute. And he was telling him, ride with us, come. And he resisted. Noah never cursed him. He never told him, get out of my life until Allah told him, he is not of your family. إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ Meaning, the family of the believers. He is not of your family. But Allah never told him this from the beginning. Realize this. He didn't tell him, do you know what Nuh? He is never going to believe. So let him now. Leave him and focus on something different. So we should never give up on a child so long we are breathing, so long as he or she is breathing. We keep inviting them, we keep calling them our children, we keep caring for them. Okay, now, what are then the rights of children on their parents? This is the topic, right? The first thing is to have fit parents. What is a fit parent Islamically? How is a fit parent defined? If you're given a choice between something good and something half good, what, what is the choice? If they are all the same price, you pick what is good, right? You pick what's excellent. So if you have a choice between a Muslim wife and a Christian wife, where do you go? The Prophet says, if you have two Muslim wives, pick the one that's best in religion. So it goes without saying that you have a choice between a Muslim and a Muslim, the choice is clear. So the parent, the, the, the most fit parent is one who is Muslim, caring, selfless, because there's a lot of sacrifice that you have to put forth. There's a lot of care required of parents to, to offer to children. Uh, there is a lot of tolerance required of parents. There is a lot of education that parents have to be able to learn and willing to learn, to sit down, read books, watch videos, listen to audio tapes, uh, uh, visit places, attend workshops, and share information with others and listen to others. Uh, to, to be balanced, to be disciplined. You're the one who's going to establish discipline in the life of your children. So if you tell them you have to wake up at Fajr and you don't, then what happens? You tell them, read the Quran, memorize the Quran. Oh daddy, how much of the Quran do you memorize? It's like this joke that says, a man you know, called his son in the fifth grade and he said, son listen to me, when Eisenhower was your age, fifth grader, he used to be on top of his class, straight A all the time, the top in sport, the top in this, the top in that. And the young man looked up and he said, Dad, when he was your age, he was the President of the United States. <laughs> so, so kids also have their own parallels. They have their own measures. So don't be uh, so confident of yourself when you keep pushing them when you're not pushing yourself. They want to see you providing the model. I am pushing myself to do this. I am pushing everybody, not only you, but I'm pushing myself starting with this. So discipline, consistency, love, mercy, patience, justice, cooperation, organization, commitment, sociability. All of these are, I'm, I'm listing a lot of things. Maybe everybody will say, oh, come on. There is nobody who has all of this. Yes. Yes, there is nobody who has everything. But this is the model that we've seen, and I picked those from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. So, there is an example you strive to reach, no matter how far it may look, 
One day you will get there. You know, ask yourself every time compassion is needed. Am I exercising enough compassion? Patience is needed. Am I patient enough? Cooperation between you and your spouse. You ask, how much cooperation do I provide? Because without measuring, without having a target, you will never reach anywhere. So this is a good uh, target to, to look forward for. Then the Prophet ﷺ gives us also the guidance to be picky. You know, when you pick a spouse, I know that most of you, if not all of you are married, but those who are not yet, you want to pick a spouse? Look to the Prophet ﷺ and ask him, what kind of wife, what kind of husband should I look for? And he gives you guidance. He says to the parents, uh, look for a spouse that is fit for your daughter because فَإِنَّ الْعِرْقَ دَسَّاسِ Choose for your offsprings because parents' habits turn into their children. And you are not picking only a wife, you're also picking with her uncles, granddads, nephews, nieces, for your children. So you're not just picking a companion, a friend or somebody, if it doesn't work then we'll do this now. You're also picking a family for your children. Choose for your offspring. Also, uh, talking about the wives, the Prophet ﷺ uh, uh, guides and says, if you get a person with whom you are pleased with their religiosity, their religion, and their manners. Most of us are focused on religion. If somebody has a beard and a jilbab, then this is a good man. But the Prophet is saying religion and manners. Because some people are very good with Allah. How, what could they do to, to, to harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Nothing. So they end up harming people. They end up with rough manners with humans, but very kind, very nice with Allah. How could they be otherwise anyway? So they read the Quran, they pray at the mosque, they do this, they attend lectures, but when it comes to manners with their wives and their children, they are even sometimes not even available. And what, uh, something telling about this is, the Prophet is not saying, pick somebody who is very religious, or pick somebody who is not religious. The Prophet is saying, you ought to be satisfied with their religion. Why? This is very wise. Why? Because not all of us are of the same level of commitment and understanding. So pick someone that is really parallel to your life. A little bit better than you, so that you can improve and try to jump to, to join him or her. But pick somebody close. So you're not, for example, starting to commit to Islam today, and you want somebody, for example, a wife that has a niqab, that memorizes the Quran, that does this, that does this, and then you end up being very much way behind. And she will be pulling your hair, trying to pick you to climb the next step in the stairs. So you need to pick somebody who's acceptable to you, and relatively uh, close to you, but a little bit better. Then also the same thing, how much time? Five minutes. Okay, I will run. So catch up with me now. Are you able to read this? Yeah. Are, so I can run quick, quicker than what I... Okay. Okay. So also a woman is not to be married for her beauty or her wealth. Likewise, a man ought not to be married for his wealth or looks or anything else but for religion. Also, don't marry women for their beauty. Uh, their beauty may lead them to indulgence. Don't marry them for their money. Their money may turn them into tyrants. Likewise, a man can also be turned into a tyrant and controlling uh, freak if, if he has wealth and control, power and uh, all of this. Marry them instead, the Prophet says, for their religion. Indeed, a black, deaf, but religious woman is better. Come on, why is he mentioning black? Why is the Prophet mentioning black? Is this... No, because he's addressing a society that calls the black people slaves and servants. Until today, many of the Arab countries would call a black person abd, which means servant, when the man or the woman is not a servant. Okay? But this is inheritance. So the Prophet is turning the society around saying, you know what? Those guys that you call abd, <laughs> they are abdullah. And when they are abdullah, they are better than other ones and than you. So the Prophet is turning things around, trying to correct the concepts. Also, uh, in fit parenting, the best of pleasure in this life, the Prophet ﷺ says, is what? A righteous wife, likewise a righteous husband. 
because this is a person that you spend the rest of your life with. So if, if, if the person is righteous, he or she will always incorporate Quran and the Sunnah as reference for their behavior and their conduct. Uh, marriage is described in the hadith as what? Captivity, you know? And by the way, for those of you who know Arabic a little bit, the word in Arabic is usra. It comes from the root word asara. And uh, to, 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 uh, to be a captive of somebody can be very negative and very positive. Can be very negative when you are POW, right? Prisoner of war, you're captured in the battlefield, okay? Enemy combatant. <laughs> then, uh, but if you are captured by somebody's generosity, courtesy, support, and care, then this is a very positive uh, captivity. And the essence of the word usra is that the assumption here is that people are attracted to each other by the goodness that they share with each other. This is what the family is supposed to be, to be attractive. So you are captive, but not against your will, but we turn it into a negative captivity when everybody hates everybody and when everybody says, I'm only here for the kids. Were it not for the kids, I would have left. That becomes negative captivity and not the intended positive usra as it's called in Islamic uh, literature. Uh, the second right after fit parents is a good environment. What constitutes a good environment? Peaceful home, decent and moral neighborhood, decent school, access to mosque and good Muslims to make friends and pick good habits, and family values and the educational system, library at home with books, audio and video, CDs and everything. These are resources that are vital for the kids because if, if those are not there, they are picking from everybody else but you. Then you have minimum or no TV. If you want to raise Muslim kids, you don't want somebody else telling them how to think, how to feel, how to laugh, and when to cry. You want them to be your children, not the children of the TV. And the more they spend of time with the TV, the more they become the TV children, much more than your own. So you have to see what it is that you want them to be exposed to on the TV uh, because sometimes we let the kids watch because it's a children program. They are making a contest. It's fun. They are laughing. They are gaining information. But you don't know what the content says. And you have to be aware that behind every message there is also a hidden message. Okay. Minimum or no TV. Uh, extended family or else community support. In our situation here Many of us do not have their extended families. So we have to be the families of each other. Those of us who embrace Islam leave behind all of their extended family. They may be living as neighbors, but they can't have their kids, you know, mingle with the rest of the extended family. They have to have the rest of the community as their own uh, substitute extended families. Otherwise their kids get lost and we have to pay attention to this. Then after birth, the right to have the Adhan and the Iqama. What, what does the Adhan do? What does the Iqama do? Do children come up from the cradle to, to pray? Because the Adhan is intended to call people to pray, right? What does it do in this case? Let me take you back to the Surat Al-A'raf, the verse that we recited in the beginning. The Adhan here comes to spark and inspire the seed of faith that was implanted in the child before even his parents' creation. Allah said that he implanted that seed, right? The Adhan ignites that seed. And in many cases, I have seen children, once you make the Adhan, their whole mood changes. If you have this experience, uh, you can tell about the same thing. Uh, why do you make the Adhan in the right ear and the Iqam in the left ear? This is something I could not figure out. Uh, but I know that uh, uh, the word Allah uh, has power of its own and it works into the soul and the spirit in a mysterious way nobody can explain and that's why the child despite the fact he is not called to pray at the time but the call of prayer reminds him of who is central in his life from the beginning of his creation he receives the word Allah 
and with it Allahu Akbar, which means He is coming to the care of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Love and nurture, very important, that you exercise love and let your children know that you love them, not by the words. Words are important, but also by the positive relationship you have. Good name and a nickname. The Prophet ﷺ used to give nicknames to kids and used to change names of even adults who, whose parents gave them bad names at young age. We have in Egypt people calling their kids what? al jahshul <laughs> Very bad names. And I'm sure that the bad names are in abundance everywhere, but just uh, I remember this one. So if, if, if your child doesn't get a good, what is a good name? What's the difference between a good name and a bad name? A good name is a name that reflects positive identity. Okay, positive expectations. Like you name your child after a companion or after a name of a prophet that gives them a sense of identity, a sense of belonging. You name them a, a non-Muslim name, like you know, an English British name or things of this sort. You also are giving them loyalty and allegiance to the Smith family, to this family, and instead of a Muslim identity. So names do have meanings uh, in, in, in most cases, and they reflect identity as well. The aqiqa is very important. Uh, uh, it's a sunnah uh, from the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu and he didn't like the name. The word aqiqa came from the Abrahamic tradition. Uh, where uh, the Arabs uh, not only would slaughter a sheep or something uh, when the child is born, uh, but they will invite people to celebrate. It serves in several ways. One is the recognition of the community as to whose child is this. So it, it links lineage, it makes known in the community, this family has a daughter, this family got a son, so everybody knows. So it helps establish genealogy and connection and the honor of the child and the family connection. It also helps in a different way. Arabs used to believe that if I slaughter something uh, when my child is born and uh, give it to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala as a gift for my friends and family and everybody else, then uh, there is a good likelihood that my child will be, will be as obedient to me as Ismail was to his father. Okay? Which means it is a disobedience repeller. That's what the name is, Aqiqa. It is a disobedience repeller. It repels against and defends against disobedience. The Prophet didn't like the name, but left it as is because of the negative reflection of changing it. And the Arabs used to use what is called Asma'ul Addad. They use the name, but they mean the opposite. So the Aqiqa is supposed to bring obedience, not disobedience. Anyway, circumcision, Briefly said, it is, uh, it is mandatory for the boys, only recommended for the girls as needed. And as needed, a gynecologist can tell you how this would work. Uh, provisions and health care is also uh, part of the rights of the children, that they eat from halal sources, of course, and they eat moderately and appropriately and as needed. Uh, we, we focus very much on food, and we'll talk about this in uh, the next presentation, as part of the uh, satisfaction you know, uh, scheme that we, we work with children. If they cry, give them food. If they scream for anything, give them food. Uh, if they do something good, give them food. As if food is the only reward in the world. So we have to be moderate and balanced on this. Early childhood care, they have the right to playing, and they have the right for basic training, uh, protection, physical and other harm, and against other harm, talking. Children have the right to talk, in case you did not recognize this one. Uh, the reason I say this is because uh, many of us, we are too busy, too occupied with our adult life, that when the children come to talk, it seems like intrusion into our adult life. Oh, sit down, don't talk, don't interfere, while they are learning as they talk to us. As they interrupt us, they are learning, okay? I'm not encouraging that they, you know, be taught to be interruptive, but just the, you have to accept them as part and parcel of your life. Uh, we know that the Prophet ﷺ listened to kids, uh, and it is said that a young, young girl that used to be even a, sel a servant or a slave would pick the Prophet ﷺ by the hand, and he would walk with her distances, not asking where is she taking him? 
This is how much humble alayhi salatu wasalam was. And then after a long distance, he would say, where are we going? I want to show you something. Uh, reading for the kids, uh, not only the Quran, but to expand their horizons for all and into all areas, to role model, to give them the example in you, in your lifestyle, in your commitment, in your discipline, in your organization, in your management of your time and resources, uh, constant guidance that you always on top of their needs. You always know what kind of guidance they need. You know, if they are good in school, they are not. You know, if they are good making friends, if they are good in social skills, you know what their needs are. And then uh, discipline. Finally, education, where you need to uh, nurture them to acquire the appropriate knowledge, skills, and attitudes to guide them discreetly, directly, and indirectly as needed. Social training personal relationship and personal development, business training, you have to train your children how to make money, how to manage money, how to manage bank accounts, how to make decisions related to money, because money is what we need the most as a community. And most of us adults were raised lacking the skills, how to earn good money, and how to put effort to make money, and how to manage money as we get it, and how to balance and save. By the way, in every verse in the Quran that we are instructed to spend, Allah never said, spend what we, had, we have given you. He always says, spend from what we have given you. Anfiqu mimma, which is an instruction to savings, something lost in our community. So we have to balance this also. Uh, objection and, and correction, they have the right to object. They have the right to say no. Because if they can't say no to you, they will never be able to say no to their friends and to anybody else. And, but what you need to do is to teach them when and how to express their disagreement. This is where education is needed. And finally, they have the right to be wrong. And the right to be wrong is entrenched in the nature of the child because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, Rufi'a al-Qalamu, in the hadith the Prophet says, Rufi'a al-Qalamu an thalath, the pen doesn't write the works of three categories of people, one of which is children until they grow up and mature. Why? Some of us say because they don't have knowledge, that's true. But much more important is because they don't have the will to control and discipline themselves to only do the right thing. Okay? This is the end of this one. Zakum Allah khair. Uh, we extended it a little bit of the time we took off, so we've, uh, we've questions but no answers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, if there are any questions, we can do them now or we can do them later, inshallah. Okay, if there are no questions, we'll go for the tea break then. Tea break. Okay. If you talk about teenagers who are stubborn, those are not easy guys to break their will. They are not easy. They have longer you know, inclination to patience and they will wait and see what happens. They will pull all the strings and they will do all the tricks in the world to get you to cave in. So older, teenage, stubborn boys or girls, they need a totally different methods of dealing with them. Number one, you have to level with them. You have to come down and see where they are coming from. Okay, which is empathy. You say, I understand why you don't want to do what I'm telling you to do. But do you understand why I'm asking you to do it? Oh, I know. No, no, I want you to tell me. Uh, I will tell you where you're coming from. This is where I think you're coming from. A, B, C. Is that true? Yes. Now you tell me, where do you think I'm coming from? Because that empathy creates some level of understanding reasoning, rationalization, and that brings a bridge between the parent and the child. Because teenagers are different. We'll talk about teenagers in a few minutes, but just they are different. So stubbornness with teenagers cannot be addressed the same way you deal with young children. Does this answer some of your questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sister. Um, the beginning of the lecture you said about uh, they have rights of waking them up for better, okay? Yes. What age are we talking about? Like seven is the time they have to start praying, okay? Okay? 
but waking up for pleasure is hard for little kids. So do we have to start from seven or do we have to later on age? I want to take your last part first. Waking up for pleasure is difficult. Is it really difficult? Let me ask you this. If your child goes to school, that is one hour away, and the school starts at 7.30, right? And the bus comes at 6.30 to pick the child. When do you wake up your child? It's different for us. Our kids start at 8.30, so... No, no, I'm saying as a matter of reality. What do you do as a parent? Uh, I have to wake him up with them. Okay. And he will get the kick of it, and he will develop the habit to wake up at the time you expect, right? What will you do? You will put them to sleep early, right? You will make sure that they took their dinner and they rested enough time to wake up at 6 or maybe even 5.30. That's about the Fajr time. So I just wanted to address the issue of assuming that waking up for Fajr is difficult. It's not difficult. It's a matter of habit and customs. Number two, uh, the age. I believe that kids do normally come to join their parents uh, in prayer by the age of three or even maybe younger. They come and try to do what you're doing and so on and so forth. What you may need to do is to nurture this in them. Oh, thank you that you came and stuff, you know, did you pray? Now you may want to do tasbih and teach them some words. Now say, Alhamdulillah that Allah made you pray and stuff, you, you grow older and stuff. Then by the time they become five, they are more conscientious of what prayer is more or less like. But they are not as disciplined as you wish they are. So what you need to do is to try to show them the etiquette of the environment around prayer. Not necessarily to commit to a total discipline, but to just be a little bit quiet, a little bit uh, you know, disciplined. Uh, I can tell you stories, but I don't want to waste your time, of even non-Muslim kids who come to the mosque. Uh, I, I saw this one, she was about six years old walking with her mom into the Islamic Center on her toes, literally on her toes. And I received them, I greeted them, and I asked her name and stuff, I introduced myself. And I said, uh, how can I help you? I guided them where they want. But I asked the little uh, young one, why are you walking on your toes? And she whispered to me, she said, mom said, this is a spiritual place that kids cannot be you know, running and screaming and walking as they do in other places. So she made a choice to walk in on her toes to reflect her respect for the place. Look at this and compare this with the kids of the Muslims who come and they don't have any kind of play the whole week and they run wild in the mosque. I don't know if this is true here as it is in our place. Uh, but parents say, honey, you don't do this, you don't break this, you don't do this at home. We're going to the mosque and you'll have your friends. So the mosque is the prayer place or the playing place. It's, uh, it depends who's pronouncing it. Kids don't have you know, the ability to say the R, so they say it L. So what I'm saying is, get them used to the discipline and the etiquette of prayer at young age. Then ask them when they are six and seven, do you want me to wake you to pray Fajr with us? If they say yes, or well now you have to sleep a little bit early, right? So that you can wake up. And then you wake them up when you feel they are really comfortable. And you let them miss it and ask you for it some other day. So they say, you didn't wake me up, right? And then when they grow a little bit older, like eight and nine, you give them their own alarm in their own room and ask them, do you want me to set the alarm for you so that you can wake up? Then by the age of 10, you ask them, if you wake me up, then I will give you this and this. You encourage them to take responsibility of their own you know, timing. So you take them through training. It is not about time, it's not about age, it's about how mature your child is. But I will take the lead of the Prophet. Between seven and 10 is a three long years for training. Likewise, you do the same for hijab because I know that hijab also was coming as a question. So you do the same thing. Okay, yes. Let me, let me take him. Okay. Um, so in the end of why you had the children have the right to object to their parents? Yes. Can this be, this, is this disobedience? Huh? Where's the fine line between disobedience and having the right to object? The right to object is the right to speak, but, but it is not the right to disobey. These are two different things. 
the right to object is to say, mom, I don't want to do this now. Then it's either that mom will say, honey, you must really do it now, and that becomes an issue of obedience, or mom would say, when do you think you can do it? Then it becomes an issue for discussion. So if it is a flexible timing issue, mom and you know, her daughter can keep discussing it. And it's a matter of training your child to say no when they feel like it. So that they get the training that they are not just submissive to any adult. Because in the school, you will have to teach her, right? That if the teacher tells you to do something that you think is wrong, you ask question, you challenge what she's saying until you are satisfied. And the teacher has a responsibility to explain to you. Otherwise, if you teach them, listen to your teacher no matter what, then you're setting them up for being you know, taken for granted. Okay? The issue, the issue of weight. Um, the issue of? The, I'll say the issue, uh, to just to point on that. Can we join one person? Yes. Sorry. Uh, and, and I'm just looking from, I guess, from uh, the society that myself and my parents and brothers came from, <coughs> is that we, the, the man, um, or sometimes the woman, but mostly the man, leads at home, and the model that he uses at home is one of dictatorship. It's like, you don't listen to me, you're disobeying me, you know, you're gonna get punished for it. Mm -hmm. You have a problem, you know. Yeah. Yeah, well, misunderstanding. I mean, mm -hmm. that's not mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to come up So, what's the question? Okay, the question is, <laughs> now, there's nothing to do with this. Mm -hmm. now, the question is, the language used at home, and the language spoken, and mm -hmm. how you communicate with the kids. Right. This is about modeling. Yeah. Uh, kids pick from parents. So as we said, the, the word they pronounce the first is the word they hear the most. That's no, right? Likewise, if they see the parents when they have differences, they are screaming and shouting and yelling, the kids will do the same when they get into differences, right? If they see parents sitting down discussing differences and rationalizing with each other, kids will, will also pick the same habit. But they need training. Kids need training. They learn by modeling, yes. By copying, yes but not exclusively. They also need to know the knowledge, they need to know the logic behind what they are doing, and they need to know what is the best way to even object to something that I disagree with. Because part of the biggest problems in our ummah as a whole is two things. One is, we don't know how to agree, right? <laughs> right? We are very much disagreeable, and we don't know how to even disagree when we disagree. Why? Because we're not learning those skills at young age. So we grow up to struggle with each other. Whenever we have differences, somebody's screaming and yelling to force his or her point across. But kids have to learn a better way. Honey, how better you could have said what you said? Oh, I'm sorry, did I say it in a bad way? Then they come up with a better way. But how else could you do it in even a better way? Then they come up with a better way. And sometimes they come and talk to you because they are, you know, they lost something or somebody did something to them. They come crying and screaming and looking for, you know, compassionate empathy. Come on, honey, what happened and stuff. Cool them down, but then turn them to, and this is something I do a lot with my kids. When they have differences and stuff, I say I have one of two options. Either that you solve the dispute amongst yourself, or you appoint a judge, me or your mom. So... They pick and choose. Most of the time it is mom. <laughs> so, when, yeah, when they, when, 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 but the majority of time really, they go ahead and resolve the differences between themselves. Okay, this time this is what you will do, but next time you will do this. So they learn negotiation, they learn respect, they learn listening, they learn communication in the process of guiding them in a little dispute over, for example, who does the dishes today, or uh, who's going to do this uh, chore or this assignment. Okay, time's up. Did anybody see this? Do you also say that the picture speaks more than a thousand words? Yep. Okay, what does this picture say? A thousand words. <laughs> Where are you trying to tell me to go? 
what direction am I going to go? Yeah, let's see if this. Confusion. Lack of direction. Lost. Right. No vision. Right. And they are looking at mom and dad who are not there. Right. And they are blaming them for not having direction. Right. This is exactly the case with most of the youth who are raised in the West. These guys are the least fortunate in all of the Muslim communities in one way, and they are the most fortunate of the Muslim communities in the world in another way. They are least fortunate if parents do not pay enough attention to their needs at young age. I keep repeating this, at young age, uh, you engrave something in the, you know, the stone, uh, and, and that sticks there. التعليم في الصغر كان نقش على الحجر. So when they grow older, and they do have the direction, they know where they are heading. They are happy, they are content. They are happy to be Muslims, they are happy to be with your family, they are happy to tell you, you know what, I'm proud of you as my dad. I love you and I appreciate what you have done for me and uh, uh, when uh, they face situations where they can't make a decision they have a reference they go back to you and say mom dad what can I do but when they lose this throughout their upbringing and they come to the teenage and they don't have you they go to their friends and this is not the source that you want them to get guidance from okay uh, what is the lack of vision and the lack of direction? The lack of direction is synonymous to what could be called youth syndrome. Youth by nature will lack direction. They think they know more than what they actually do. We'll talk about this a lot in the next session. But for now, I want you to focus on something. That is, is this what you want to see your children saying? Or is this where you want them to be? Lacking direction, lacking focus. I'm sure that this is not what it is. But the society in which we live is really leading to this. You're telling them one thing. The imam is saying another thing. Another imam is saying another thing. And another parent is saying to his child another thing. And the school is saying another thing. And the teacher and the TV and the coach, everybody is saying something. Where do they go? How do they on their own reconcile all of this and make sense out of it and develop direction. How do they do this on their own? Uh -huh. Parents must sit down. Sit down with your children. Almost, if you don't do it every day, do it at least twice a week. If you can't do it twice a week, at least once a week. Get them debriefed. Get them to tell you what happened in a week. Get them to tell you stories. Get them to tell you situations confrontations, communications, stories that they have read, things that they have been told, assignments that they have been given, because all of this is also part of their upbringing. You can't isolate their upbringing to a meeting on the Qur'an saying, guy, you listen to the Qur'an, you read the Qur'an, you're fine, go ahead. They are not going to be able to manage their life just by memorizing the Qur'an. It has to be a little bit more than this. Okay? Let's move a little bit to see what the environment does. The purpose, as I said in the beginning, of this presentation is to see the environment through the eyes and the lives of our children and to see how it impacts their life. When the child goes to school, I'm talking now about teenagers in particular, when they go to school they have much more choices than the ones you present to them at home. Even in Islamic school. Why? Because they hear how other kids are doing and managing their life. Oh, my dad takes me to the cinema. Last week we went to the movie and we did this and that. Even in Islamic school, right? Then the kid wants to go to the movie. They want to see the movie their friends show, you know? So you have to be cognizant that they are not living a copy of your life at home, but it is only in another place. And they go over this seven, eight hours a day, okay? And you have to be part of their life. How could you be part of their life? Sit down with them. Talk to them. Listen to them is much even more important than talking to them. 
Most of the time, when we sit with our kids, we have a message, we have a khutbah, we have a lesson, we have a lecture to give. But most of the time, what they need is somebody to listen to them. Because they have issues that you may not address. So the more that you develop the relationship between you and your child, especially at the teenage, the better off you are as a parent. The better off he has a chance to be guided. And the better off that he is off to, to make friends and make choices and make decisions for his or her life. Let's take the next picture and see what happens here. I don't know where the animation went. This is supposed to be... Uh, I'm sorry. Because the animation has something that I wanted you to be exposed to. Uh, let me see. Okay. Now we have it, okay. The intention here is not the game. The intention here is to really draw your attention to something I believe quite important. What does this tell you? What does the picture speak about anyway? The brick wall. Mm, the brick wall. The society. Okay. Okay, it's a brick wall between you and your identity, you and your religion, and it calls for conformity to be applauded. <laughs> the more you conform to the group, the more the applause you get. Right? This is typical of any society, a Muslim society or a non-Muslim society. Every society likes to see their members conform to the expectations of the norm. So if the norms are un-Islamic, then you get the applause for being as much un-Islamic as possible. And if the norm is an Islamic norm, then you get the applause for complying with Islam. Right? So the environment plays a great deal of role in shaping not only your expectations, but shaping your life according to the expectations of others. Okay? Uh, why is a society a real brick wall? between the individual and their identity or the individual and their religion why? because the society's expectations are rigid okay if you don't meet their expectations all of it you always get blamed I'll give you a story of a person I used to know about 35 years ago at that time he started to grow his beard so his aunt told him, you know, listen honey, you, you know, you're praying, you're fine, you go to the mosque, but there's no real need to grow your beard. It makes you awful and, you know, old and you don't need to do this. Plus, you know, people who are growing their beard are not necessarily real angels, you know. They also can lie and steal and do things, so you, your manners are good. So don't, don't be like them, you know, don't... The same thing that, you know, uh, you can hear from people saying, uh, don't talk about jihad because people who are saying jihad and stuff, they are committing terrorism, they are this, they are this, and you want to be moderate. So the society is always in the business of desynthesizing its members to be attuned to the expectations of the society. And the more the kids are pressured by the society, and the more they crave for acceptance, the more they are under what is called the peer pressure. And the more they get under the peer pressure, and they do not have the tools to push back, the more they conform to those expectations. It is on us parents to sort things out for them. Honey, not everything that you hear out there is good. Not everything that you're invited to is something that you should accept. Not every book that you read is something that is educational. Not every video that you watch 
is a good idea to implement. Not every movie that you hear about is something that you have to watch and see. So there has to be some process to sort the society out for our children. So that as they sail through it, it doesn't become a dark black ocean of troubles. And instead it becomes a chartered water. They have a map, they have a vision, they know where they are heading. That gives them power over the brick wall. And also what gives them power is the ability to push the society back. Saying, do you know what, but I'm a Muslim, I don't drink. But I'm a Muslim, I don't dance with girls. You know, but I'm a Muslim, I will never take off my hijab to join the PE. You know, I, those are the things that we need to teach our kids to draw the line between keeping their identity and being actively engaged in the society. And they are not going to learn those on their own. We have to give them the tools. And that means that parents have to be engaged in the school system. Whether it is the public school, the government school, or the Islamic school, you have to be involved. To shape the environment as much as you can, along with other parents, the way you want it. I don't want my kid to be exposed to this. In America, I don't know what the system here says, there's something called health education, which ends up to be sex education. Okay? And they teach kids all things, including values and judgments over those activities, without the parents knowing what the course is really about. Parents have to have a say. So they send you a note. So most Muslim parents opt out. You know what? I don't want my kids to be there. But very few parents are those who say, show me what the course is about. And go talk with other parents and say, we the parents have the power to tell the system what to offer our kids. If we have to have this kind of education, we have to have a say. Or else, to form a group of Muslim parents and teach the kids by one of these parents or two or three as to what exactly they need to learn about the subject. And instead of just either opting out and making the kids feel less than everybody else, isolated from everybody else, or letting them go with everybody and hit the brick wall that, oh yeah, I have to try to be able to marry. Uh, my oldest kid was in the sixth or seventh grade when I was taking him home from the mosque uh, Friday night and he said, Dad, um, I got lots of questions that I can answer about Islam and stuff, but this one in particular, I didn't know how to answer. I said, what? He said, a couple of girls asked me, uh, so Haib, if uh, you do not date according to your religion, how do you get married? He didn't know the answer. And I'm sure that your kids don't know the answer either, right? And many of them get it from any source other than you. But we have to talk to them. So I told them how I got married, and how is it likely for him to get married without having to date. And I told them about the engagement system in Islam. What does it serve, how does it work, and so on and so forth. It, it gives comfort for a teenager to know how to answer challenging questions. Okay, he, t he could talk about Jesus, he could talk about Muhammad, he could talk about the Quran, he could talk about the Bible, but he didn't know this particular issue. How many issues are there that our kids do not know how to tackle, and they are not talking to us about? Okay, again, why is a society uh, big on conformity? Because it creates cohesiveness in the society. If everybody is like everybody else, it is easy to govern. It's easy to manage. It's like us parents, we want all of our children to be one and the same. They are never going to be the same. Also, we have to teach the societies in which we live that diversity is a source of strength. You know, conformity is a source of weakness. That everybody is trying to please everybody by making it look like I am like everybody. This is not, uh, this is artificial. And we have to resent it. And we have to bring our values to strengthen our society. We have to bring our beliefs to correct and strengthen the society where they are wrong. Okay, let's move. Oh, this one also. I'm not going to do this for everyone. This is, let me see if I can go back and apply to all here. I'm sorry for this.
This is a technical glitch because of my ignorance here. Uh, hmm? I think you have to get in a different mode where you can see all the slides at the same time. Um, it, it applies to it applies to all. If if you say apply to all, let me see if I can play. Okay, let me see if we can do it here. Now it should apply to all, right? A picture is worth a thousand words. What does this picture tell us? Yeah, everything is halal. Right? And marriage has obstacles. Marriage is not easy. Marriage is not easy. Uh, what I call here is, in the West in particular, and this unfortunately is spreading even in Muslim lands, uh, the, the, the most prevalent attitude on the side is that it is sin friendly. It is something of the past that you can walk in the street and some elderly person can tell you, this is wrong honey, you don't do this. Now everybody is minding their own business. Now you can see kids doing everything in the street and nobody cares. Uh, likewise in the school. It, does, it doesn't matter what they think or what they believe or what they say. What matters, did you do your homework? You're fine. That's all what I care about as a teacher. So there is no source of values, there is no sense of direction, there is no sense of morality or value judgment. Okay? The only value judgment that the kids get is, oh, you don't really dance, don't you? Huh? How do you have weddings, do you know? When you celebrate, what do you do? So the kid feels that they are really strange, you know? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, oh, you've not dated anybody yet? You're 17, you're going to college? Honey, you better wake up and smell the coffee, do you know? How are you going to pick a husband, do you know? You're going to get somebody from heaven or what? Is your family going to arrange it for you? Right? <laughs> and the kids really think about it. How is it going to happen? Okay, you're 17, you never dated anybody? You don't know guys, right? So, if you don't drink, if you don't dance, if you don't date, then you're lost. And, and those things are not strange. Don't think about those issues from your own perspective as an adult who's most probably grown overseas or with your own value system. But think about it from the perspective of the current environment in which your children are living. So don't think of those issues as, you know, kind of like, oh, it's irrelevant, not my kids. Because, unfortunately, yes, there were teenagers who were Muslims who were, for example, uh, did very awful things that we discovered in Canada, in America. Very awful things. And I'm sure you have stories here to tell. Okay? Uh, many of them I have seen personally in the criminal justice system, in youth detention centers, in the courts. Doing what? Running with gangs, going for weapons, doing drugs, uh, selling porn stuff. So, if, if those kids are not really aware what is the danger out there, then they can get swamped, they can get sucked in the system. And it's easy. All what it takes is a nice guy that can convince your son, come on, it's only a paintball game, you know, let's go. And then from paintball to AK-47 to a bank robbery, and then what? <coughs> so it escalates much quicker than what you think. Okay? So we have to be on the lookout from the beginning before things escalate. And, uh, and, and recognize the fact that the, the environment out there is sin-friendly. What is sin-friendly? It means it encourages sin. It doesn't repel it, it doesn't look down at it, in fact, it does the opposite. 
If you're too righteous, I'm afraid you become fanatic. Right? You become an extremism. You can become a turn into a terrorist. And the kids, you know, they clinch. They don't want to be labeled in a negative way. So. What is wrong with the system today? <laughs> it froze. <laughs> what are you doing? It's funny. Okay, it's no. It's okay. Let's get to the next one. Just change to mask click. Hmm? Advanced. It can work both ways, it should. It's okay. This is the way it goes anyway. The society also is not short on ideas. You go to any college campus and you will find like 10,000 clubs. From the bald headed to the long hair to the ponytail club. Everything has a club. Right? So the society offers much more opportunities than you care for your son. Come on then you care for your son to be exposed to. And with this, they offer them lots of options, lots of activities. So you need to discover from your kid what kind of clubs are there in his or her school, okay? What activities do they like? What things do, you want, do they want to join? Why do they want to join it? What they see themselves doing as Muslims in that club, okay? And get to know how are they making their friends. What ideas are influencing their, man, uh, their mind? Because as you teach them that Allah created you, that's why you worship Him, they are teaching Him in the school that you came from apes. Right? There is no God, there is no creation. You evolved. So the whole system of worship because He created you crumbles on the assumption and the belief that no, I evolved. How could you prove that I did not? So something as simple as that, can impact his faith, his belief, and his commitment to religion. So what many of the children do in that case is they, they do at the school what they believe is scientifically acceptable, and they comply at home to show you the good faith that they have. But then by the time they become stronger, they start to show their actual true belief. That you know what, I never truly believed I was created. I know I was born. But man didn't come out of creation. We didn't study this in science. Even in genetics, they prove that it is wrong. And science can't be wrong. So take him now that he's 18 or 20, and try to bring him back to be 6, and, and recreate the, the, the belief system in his head. It's very difficult. So you have to monitor. Faith is not something that you saw at one time, and you harvest at another. Unless you nurture it, unless you nurture it, unless you develop it, it fades away in the noise and confusion of the environment. So we have to be careful. Lots of ideas and lots of skillful propagators. What does this say? They go to school at what age? Five, six? Right? And then by the time they are ten, they got used to so many things that you've not taught them at home. Right? And it's not all about education and math and science. It's about social skills. It's about relating to others. It's about the perception of who the other person is. Right? Boy or girl. Right? And if you do not give them guidance from the beginning, they end up picking it from the society. So, how to relate to each other, 
what is the right perception, what is the right concept of how to interact with the other gender is also very important. This picture is, uh, is very telling for me. We, we get scholars uh, to come and visit with us from time to time. And one day, a, a visiting scholar was sitting with the sisters, talking with them in Ramadan about raising children. And a young girl, I don't know if this is the same here, but it looks like it's the same, because I had one last night. I had ice cream also, uh, thanks to Brother Ahmed. Uh, and the kid entered the room where the scholar was talking to uh, the mothers, the sisters, and the kid had a huge ice cream cone. She was only about four years old. So he looked at the girl and he said, what is this? We are here to talk about raising children, not uh, lying cups. What is this? If at that young age, this is the cone that a little girl is holding, when she grows as old as, what do you get her? <laughs> <laughs> but eating was not a, a, a kind of like side activity for the Prophet. The Prophet paid attention to kids as they eat. Why? Because eating is not about only social etiquette as to how to eat nicely and cleanly, but it's also about consumption. It's about consumerism. It's about economy. It's about greed. It's about satisfaction. It's about lust. It's about a lot of things. And uh, I want to tell you something that I have seen in many children. Children who are greedy when it comes to food are less likely to have control over other desires as they grow older. I want you to pay attention. If you have a child who is very hinge on food and he wants to take lots of it unnecessarily, you have to be careful. It's not only about weight, it's not about hygiene, it's not about etiquette, it's not about organization, it's about greed and uh, submission and caving in to the lust for food. Okay? And if he caves into the lust of food, there is a good likelihood he can cave into other lusts and other desires. So food is very important. Uh, as an issue with children and an issue of tarbiyah as well. And when your children go to school and they start activities like, you know, coloring and painting and stuff like this, not all coloring books are equally the same. Not all math books are equally the same. Uh, I have seen in math books, you know, adding up 10 crosses plus 2 crosses equals how many cross? Okay? Or the heart for Valentine, 3 hearts and 5 hearts equals how many hearts? So, even math has been incorporated into, and values have been entered into the math, so that the kids can subtly pick values, and pick sides. Okay, so not all education, not all coloring is innocent activities, even if it is written in children's books. Not all cartoons that are made for children are innocent because they are made for children. In fact, it is exactly the opposite. It used to be innocent 20 some years ago, but uh, uh, since the mid of the 80s, the cartoon producers have also incorporated certain values, social etiquette, social values, social beliefs, religious beliefs, were also entered into the cartoon. So exposing your children to anything is a potential hazard to his faith and to his belief. I'm not calling for isolation by any stretch of the imagination. I'm calling for awareness. I'm calling for parents to be informed as to what the kids are really getting exposed to as they are sent to the preschool or the kindergarten or even the first grade. They are not necessarily engaged in quote-unquote purely uh, innocent activities of learning. Even the computer that once was taken for the most innocent thing. You know, kids are learning typing, they learn how to visit the internet and collect information. I'm sure today, even non-Muslims are fighting to get the internet under control. Why? The exposure to 100,000 times as much. And if they don't go to visit the site, the site comes to visit them. 
the spam, the pop-ups, all of those things, they come in the face of the child. So computers are very dangerous. In fact, now they are more dangerous than TV. Because t TV is normally put in the family room, unless you provide one for the kids' room, which I advise strongly against. But computers are typically put in the kids' rooms, where parents little, you know, uh, have little access or little visits uh, to see what is going on. And when they come, the kids are very, you know, uh, sophisticated. They can change the screen in less than a second, right? They can change it by even instructing the computer by voice. You know, tell him when I say, welcome mom, that you change the screen. <laughs> yes. So, I believe we have to be careful. What are we exposing our kids to every day? Then, the same five minutes? Okay, <laughs> getting close. Then you see those, uh, these two pictures, what do they say here? These guys that you see in either the newsroom or the boardroom or... What do they reflect? They reflect images of success. These guys are successful people, you know? A businesswoman, a businessman, and you know, a board member, a chairman of the board, a CEO. All of these words are floating around to create desires in the children to imitate. In the 60s and the 70s, it used to be only movie stars that you know, people are told to look up to. But now other images are popping up with different names. But the lifestyles behind those are not necessarily the ones that you want your kids to grow up in. So you have to also even unfortunately be careful when your kids look at these people and say, I want to be a broadcaster. And you may say, oh yeah, we need people in the media. But you don't know that she wants to dress like her, she wants to talk like her, she wants to have a life like her. So don't take innocent comments from the kids as always innocent. You always have to ask the question, why do you think you want to do that? Anyway, then we're told that, you know, kids will have to make friends, you know. If they don't have non-Muslim friends, they will not be able to do da'wah when they grow up, right? If they go to only the Muslim school, they cannot manage their life in the college. Wrong. They can and much better so than those who grew up in the public school. Why? Because every creature that Allah created needs a period of custody, a period of incubation. Okay? For sucking milk, it's two years, right? For sucking the faith, it's about ten years. You get the basics of it, right? You get the hang of it, right? Then to learn how to exercise your life according to your faith, it takes the rest of your life. Right? So, the period of, of uh, incubation is divided into four periods. Young children at the age of baby until two years old, then between three and six and seven, then from there to teenage, and from there on from teenage until you die, you still need to be incubated. In what way? As an adult, I don't need incubation, right? I can do anything I want, but no, I do. I do. I do need your company, right? We need the company of each other. And this is a system of incubation, okay? It's not total incubation as you talk about it literally and scientifically, but it is a way of protecting one in the group, right? Children need it more than anybody else. Why? Because they lack the knowledge, and as I mentioned before, they lack the will, and they lack the options, they lack the vision. So they need longer period of incubation whereby until they develop the knowledge, the information, and the will, then they can fly on their own in the college and beyond. But before that, it's very difficult to say, I have to send them so that they can be successful, they learn the other kids' lifestyles and they become stronger in faith. They are not going to become stronger. They are going to become weaker. Because every day, instead of their faith growing and being nurtured in the Islamic school, it gets challenged. They get other options of other belief system, other lifestyles. So, uh, they get weakened and not nurtured. Of course, sports is one very good attraction for kids. And unfortunately, Muslim parents also, we can't really isolate our kids. You know what? You take them to the soccer game, you take them to the baseball or the football game, 
and you sit down and let them play Muslim, non-Muslim. It's a, it's a ball. But listen to how they talk to each other. Listen what makes them laugh and how they laugh. How they criticize each other. What do they do when they get angry? It's an acquired behavior from the group. And it's infectious. Whatever the popular boy on the field uh, does, then everybody wants to do to become popular. So it leads also into another system of conformity and trial to uh, uh, imitate everybody else. Okay, do you want to be a professional? You have to look like these guys, right? To dress professional and to act professional and to look professional. And then the society takes you one step further. Don't just be professional, be like us. This is St. Patrick Parade. Uh, oh, there is nothing. The kids will go, they will watch. It's music and it's fun. And they see other kids walking with their parents and stuff. But it's inviting. It's inviting. Uh, you know, the people uh, of the children of Israel, what did they tell Moses? They tell him, اجعل لنا إلها كما لهم آلهة Make a God for us as they have made one for themselves. Give us something. Then, I think this picture speaks much more than 10,000 words. What does it say? The P version. Hmm? Conformity. Yeah. Conformity is about being pulled from several directions. And then the stronger pull ends up winning your heart and mind and maybe your life. And the more the kids get pulled in different directions with equal strength, the more confused they become. And the more they become what they call uh, multiple personalities. They have one personality for home, one for the school, one for the mosque, one for the peer that they go out with and stuff. And then we think and say, oh, we didn't know when did he start to be like this. Because we accepted the pretension. When they were young and they had no choice, they pretended that they are complying. They are praying, they are fasting, they are this, they are, and we accepted the pretension instead of the reality. Why? Because we took action for faith. We took action as a substitute for faith and understanding. And we are focused on do and don't much more than we are focused on understanding, reasoning, conviction. And this is something because it takes effort to reach this. It's much less effort to say, you have to do this, than saying, honey, we need to know, why do we pray? Right? What benefit should we get when we pray? What should we be thinking of when we pray? When we stand before Allah, what should come through our heads and hearts? What should we come out with as we finish prayer? So that we can move on to the next activity. Where should we focus in our prayer? So it's much more difficult to explain, sit down and entertain all of this, than saying, you know what, you have to pray. They finish, say, salam alaykum, alaykum salam, let go. Mommy, now can I do this? Yes, honey, go. Then honey goes to play two more hours because he prayed for two minutes, right? And he don't know what the five hours are about. So we have to balance what we give our kids. But this also tells us something. That people are attracted to styles and the outlook, the features. Then they are attracted to the substance. So don't get hard on your kids when they want to fashion a model or something, unless it is something in their head that is much more than the outlook. And in many cases it is. Because why do somebody, why does somebody want to imitate somebody else? Unless they believe they are less and he or she is better. And I want to be better. I want to be like him. These are cycles that our youth go through every single day. And the central piece here 
is that every issue of those is interconnected with the life of the child. You look at social and media pressure, you look at the kids isolation between two rejecting cultures. They are not good enough Muslims for us to embrace them and they are not good enough conforming to the society to be embraced by the society. They keep getting rejected by both sides. Uh, the infrequent mosque attendance uh, that you don't bring them except once in a week even so if at all insufficient youth programs in any Muslim community youth are getting the least uh, weak Islamic centers people are bickering much more than organizing people are fighting much more than working uh, lack or weakness of the Arabic language which is central to first-hand information on Islamic resources the insufficient Islamic knowledge. How could somebody judge anything based on any value when he doesn't know what the values are? So these are very serious challenges. I believe I will, uh, I will stop here. So uh, this session is intended to give us some clear understanding of the nature of youth as an age group. It will take us from uh, where they become youth and then uh, what motivates their behavior and then we'll move the next session as to how to deal with them uh, as, as we get to know what their nature is. At the expense of generalization most youth are by and large going to act the same way in similar situations. Uh, just the only difference you will see is uh, based on their education, individual circumstances, but more or less uh, the bulk of the, of the description that we're giving here is quite universal amongst youth groups, okay? And I'm talking about teenagers, in particular between 13 and 19 and 20, 21, that young age. Uh, f the first question that comes to mind is my son an adult or a child? You know, by the time they reach 13, they are acting somewhere as sometimes as children, sometimes as adults. And we parents get confused and get puzzled. You know, uh, Asma, I'm leaving you with your siblings, take good care of them, and so on and so forth. And as soon as mom comes back, she will find that Asma has hit her young sister because she didn't listen and has done this. Asma, I told you, don't touch them, don't you do this. Then Asma is puzzled. Am I the adult left with them to take care of them? And I do this like a mom, right? Or am I the baby that she's screaming at me? So that confusion is, is there. And it is because of that central question that youth are not children, but they are not adults. They are somewhere in the middle. They are in a transition period, and their curve is moving towards adulthood, some faster than others. Some act more like adults under the supervision of adults that they respect. But they act like children when they are with children. Okay, that's natural, that's expected. But the central issue is for us adults to recognize the fact that they are neither full-blown adults, nor are they children. Some of them will linger in childhood habits for a long time, depending on how much maturity is kicking into their heads and their hearts based on their information. So they are acting sometimes as old children or young men and women, uh, sometimes acting in innocence, sometimes in deliberation with intention, sometimes acting in ignorance, sometimes with full knowledge of what they are doing, sometimes they act out of the desire to be uh, independent, but sometimes they act very dependent. I cannot do it, I cannot do it. Why? You're, you're a man, you say I'm my own man, but they can do it. So uh, sometimes they act out of obedience and sometimes out of rebellious uh, attitudes. Sometimes they act out of physical needs and sometimes uh, act motivated by grown up needs because they are developing part of both. Uh, sometimes they are acting because the space they need, and I'm talking about the social space, uh, is not enough for them. They need larger space. Uh, so between the two, 
you will find that children have needs, direction, and motivations that are different from adults. And youth get something from both sides depending on the situation and the degree of their maturity and their ability to handle the situation either as adults or as children or somewhere in the middle. Children act out of short-term thinking. They need something, they need it now, and they need it here, right? But adults are calculating. They look, you know, they say, you know what, I will do it. But then in one hour they come and say, you know what, remember I did this and I want that. But they don't tie it together. But they do it out of planning and long-term uh, recognition of time. So these are some basic uh, things that you need to look at as a parent. What falls under a child's behavior and why? What falls under an adult's behavior and why? Then we have to look at the youth nature. What constitutes uh, a typical youth nature? What is the nature of youth? What should a natural youth be like? First, understanding self in relationship to the environment. That becomes a huge issue with the youth. They want their own space. They want to be their own free men and women. They want not to be second guest. They, they want to do things their way. So let us look at some of those things. Their physical growth has an impact on both their thoughts and their understanding and their reception ability to take what you say for what it is. They always take things their way. They process information in a different way than the one you're delivering, the piece of information you have. Also, you will find that their mental growth also has an impact. Their ability, one time they take you for the angel you say you are, the infallible human being, the prophet like dad or mom. But then as they grow older and discover you're missing on your prayer, you also get angry and you lose your temper, okay? You're not also doing your assignment on time even in your job. They discover that everybody is really fallible and they become rethinking of how innocent and sometimes stupid they were taking us for the angels we once projected ourselves to be. And this discovery can shock some and can bring some awareness to others. It depends on how they react to this. Uh, the awareness of people, the environment, and the issues also becomes different. They are not now the guys that you can say, you know what, honey, if you pray and you do this, I will give you a piece of chocolate. He can't do that. He can't bribe you know, a teenager with something like this. So you have to think as to what kind of things that you can use for conditioning to get them to cooperate. It's not the children's stuff anymore. Also, they develop that independent will away from the father, away from the mother that is their own. So now you're going to visit a family, a relative or neighbor. Then you used to pack everybody in the car and move. Now, he's a teenager. I want to sit home. You can't sit by yourself. No, I can. Why can't I? Because I told you you have to come. I don't want to come. There's nobody my age in this family, right? And maybe it's only an excuse because they want that proof and assertion that I have my independent will. I can make my choice. That is part of growth and part of becoming his own man and her own woman. I'm not saying agree or disagree, I'm not discussing the details. I'm giving you the scenarios of situations to illustrate the issue, not to agree or disagree, or to tell you what to do in every situation. Because time will not allow us really to go over this in details. Also, the rapid emotional reaction. They think that every adult that comes at them is kind of like a wild animal. So you knock on the door and you open and suddenly he jumps off the bed. Why are you jumping? I'm coming to check on you. Oh, I'm okay, I'm okay. But, but they take your entrance as an adult as an intrusion into their private life. And they want independence. They value their independence, freedom, and seclusion more than they value anything else. So you, you can't buy this away or bribe them away from this. Also, they develop new interests. You know, in the past, you could sit five kids in one room and everybody, one is coloring, one is playing this, one is playing that. But now, they have their own interests. You can't program their life for them. So if you want to organize something for them, 
they have to be incorporated. They have to be brought into discussion. They have to be uh, able to express what they want, what they don't, what they like, what they don't. Otherwise, your plan will always fail. So you have to deal with them as adult-like as much as you can because of their new interest, new character, and new development. Also, they have a big thing with authority. You know, whether it is teachers, parents, the imam, the community leaders, they always have an issue with authority. Why? Because at young age, as children, authorities superseded everything. Mom said so, right? The teacher said so, right? But by, by the time they hit the teenage, I don't like it. It's a different type of personality, different type of attitude. So we have to recognize also that that is part of their growth. The recognition of self, the assertiveness of what I want, the independent thinking, all of those come to play. Uh, but also, as I said, when they discover the, the fallibility factor of how weak and vulnerable we also are, and they discover our shortcomings, they lose some trust in us, and that's natural. They lose some trust. They know that we are humans. We are all bound to make mistakes and stuff. Don't be disappointed that they know that, because that also becomes part of their learning experience, that they are not to shoot to become angels and keep disappointing themselves and others. We don't want our children to try to become angels. We want them to try to be humans, but good ones for that matter. Okay, so the lack of trust is a positive and negative factor. We can talk about this in discussion. Their desire for separation and seclusion is also part of establishing one's own space, social and environmental space, whereby you can have four kids in one room when they were young. Now everybody wants their own room, and they don't want it just to sleep. They want to sit in the room by themselves. When the whole family is taking dinner, Come, take dinner with us. I don't want to eat now. Why? Because. <laughs> Where is the rest of the sentence? Do you know? <laughs> so that whole thing is about what? It is about, if you don't know me by now, why should I answer you anyway? <laughs> That's what it boils down to. So they give you the, those short answers. And what you need to get is, are you comfortable staying by yourself? Of course he is comfortable, he wants to be by himself. What do they do when they are by themselves? We'll talk about this at length, because that is an important element here to discuss. Challenging adults and all authorities is part of growing up. You know, when they were young and everything is yes, with or without a grudge, now they have the power to say no. They can say no and you cannot drag them and move them where you want. They have the power to say no, but challenging authority is a very important element in their growth from childhood into adulthood. It's a big move for them. So when they challenge your authority, Daddy, why did you talk to your mom like this? You know, you tell me to respect my mom, but what, why do you talk to your mom like this? It's a way of saying, I'm not seeing consistency. But they say it in their way, okay? So you need to explain yourself. You need to humble yourself a little bit as a parent and be able to be vulnerable yet consistent. Vulnerable means that you accept your weaknesses and take responsibility for your shortcomings. For example, to tell them it was wrong for me to do it. And I hope you don't end up doing this to your mom. That is responsibility, okay? <clears throat> so challenging adults and all authorities is part of their growth. Challenging established values, norms, and rules. Uh, do you know what? I, I want to stay with my friends tonight. What do you mean stay with your friends? You've never slept outside the home. Oh yeah, but tonight I am. Why? What's special about tonight? Oh, my friends are all getting together. We're staying together and stuff. You as a parent have the choice to say yes or say no. But you have to balance because everything in life is a trade-off between an interest that you are keen to keep and a relationship that you're trying to achieve. And we can talk about the balance between interests and relationships. There are models in management, uh, 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 management models that can tell you as a parent, when do you give more value to the relationship and when do you give more value for the interest that you want to keep. Th there are models to look into this. Also, 
it is good for them to challenge the values that you have established for them as children because they are going to be challenged by their friends, by the environment. And by challenging you, most of the time they are seeking answers to take to their environment. It's not that they hate what you're doing or they hate what you're instructing them to do. It is that they don't know why because at young age, they were neither able to discuss nor were they given information as to why they are doing what they are doing. Uh, rejecting criticism. Criticism is like fire for youth. You start on the note of criticism and you really ignite fire in their heart and soul and they become crazy. Why? Because for them, my decision, my attitude, my behavior is part of me. Uh, they are unable to separate themselves from their opinion. So when you discover that they are wrong in their opinion, instead of destroying their person to criticize the opinion, separate the opinion first. For example, but why, why can't I date? You know, everybody's dating. You know, and, and this is after all is a Muslim girl and her family knows it. Okay, why don't I date her? She's, she accepts it, they accept it and everything is fine. Well, this is not about you. This is the word separate. This is not about you. This is about the principle itself. Would you like somebody to do this with your sister? Would you like your sister to stay out with somebody that the family is uncomfortable with in a context that is unacceptable? It's, again, it's away from his person. But if you take the discussion in the direction of, if you do this, you're not my son, then you broke everything. There is nothing for him to keep. Okay, so you have to always keep that connection and value the relationship, but at the same time establish the principle so that you get the discussion where it should be. Reactionary and uncomfortable, that's what youth is. They react very quickly and they are very uncomfortable where they feel that they are not accepted, embraced, and uh, involved uh, in, in the circle where they are. That's why youth love to be with youth. They want to be with each other because they can relate to each other much more than they can relate with their younger sibling if you want to leave them home or with you and your friends if you want to get them to sit with you and stay with you. And that's why I was talking in the lunchtime with our brothers here about the idea of establishing Muslim youth centers. Because our mosques and our Islamic schools are unable, I believe, to attract youth or be youth friendly because of the rules, the structure, the way they are run and the way they are managed. But if you establish one single Muslim youth center somewhere in the country, other places will copy you very soon. Even if it is a small house where they can come, they can play things, they can have exercise room, they can have a small lecture room that can turn into a prayer hall as well. They can invite their friends and spend hours together and you can have an imam to come and give them lectures. You can have a, a physician to come and talk to them about lifestyle, its influence and impact on their future, things of this sort. Youth love to be with each other. So instead of picking them individually and putting them with, with adults where they don't belong, you send knowledge and information to their own gathering in their own place. Okay. Uh, also, uh, youth love to develop their own authority over others. They love it when you tell them, you are the Amir, and everybody here will have to listen. Let us see how you manage your siblings. They love to be the boss. And that is an exercise of adulthood. That's a show of how you know, they want to become like a father and a mother, and so on and so forth. So give them chances to do that. What are the basic motives for youth behavior and attitudes? Uh, those can explain to us why youth do things the way they do. The biggest motive for the youth is the emotional vacuum. See, when they were young, you used to fill this vacuum by hugging them and kissing them and playing with them. But as they grow a little bit older, you can't always hug your teenage <laughs> young men and women and do that. So you have to look for another means of keeping that emotion fulfillment running for them. 
uh, you have to uh, replace the kisses and the hugs and the chocolate and the lollipops with something that is meaningful for them, like words of appreciation, okay? Thanking them for their efforts. Good rewards that are relative to their age for their achievements, okay? A nice discussion when they do something wrong instead of rebuke and reprimand as you do young children. So we have to adjust our style of managing their life in a way that responds to their needs and corresponds to their uh, age. Also, the, despite the fact that they claim they know everything, definitely one of the biggest motives for their behavior is a lack of vision. They don't know where the future is. Uh, they sometimes see the future but just far away, and sometimes they look at the future through the eyes of the past and they become depressed, especially if they had lots of failings in the past. They were bad in math, they were bad in reading, they were having difficulty in this or that. Then they look back and say, how can I make it through the college? How can I make it to become this? So they have that lack of vision. They don't know where to go with where, uh, whatever skills they developed so far. The desire for acceptance, which is in the roots of conformity, peer pressure, okay? It is all about being accepted. And the way I always uh, advise the youth is to tell them when somebody pushes you and pushes you hard, what happens if you don't push back? You fall. Right? You fall. But if you start pushing back, you apply pressure where you can keep yourself standing. That is standing on your principles. But if you accept everybody's invitation, or everybody's pressure, then you're always out of balance. Okay, and that happens a lot with the youth. Rushing results, they want things, you know, like children. They want it, they want it now. Dad, I need a car. And they think that the car should have come yesterday anyway. So when he says, I need it, he has been so patient. He didn't ask for it for two years. So when, when he comes and says it, they consider themselves, you know, I, I humiliated myself asking for it, and you're not even giving it to me? So it's always that they need whatever they need. They need it here and now and immediately. But they live also in a lot of confusion. We will also talk a lot about the sources and reasons for confusion. Part of it, we spoke about it. Their confusion about whether they are young children or grown up adults. And that we discussed in the beginning of this presentation. But the fear factor is an overwhelming factor in their life. Youth are afraid, we'll talk about fear reasons and factors in the next uh, few screens uh, very quickly, but they are afraid of failure, they are afraid of rejection, they are afraid of authority, and they are also afraid of responsibility. There is a lot of reasons for them to be afraid, but they don't say it, and you don't see it. And this is why many of the youth do not talk to us they never want to be vulnerable. They never want to look weak or needy because their ex exhibition of adulthood and the induction to adulthood is to be strong, to be mature. You know, I'm independent. I can do it my way. You know what? Even if I failed, I will keep trying until I did it before dad knows that I failed three times. But I will show him the final transcript anyway. <coughs> Let's talk about the youth confusion and fear. What is the underlying reasons for that fear and confusion? Number one, they are confused between the issue of being grown up, how to handle myself in terms of sex education, my relationship with the other gender, and sexual responsibility. They are also confused between their own social life and their desire for privacy to reflect and ponder and resolve issues that goes through their head. Also, they are confused between respecting adults, something required of them every time, and being independent, which results in challenging authority, defying orders sometimes, to prove that I am assertive and I'm a grown-up. They are also confused between dialogue, and you must have heard this from your teenage a lot of time, and argument. Don't argue with me. I'm not arguing, I'm just saying my opinion. So you need to explain what is the difference between an argument 
and a discussion. And instead of just blaming them for being argumentative, following rules and discovering the world. This is the age of trying everything, taking risks, adventure, okay? But you parents expect them to comply and be safe and be cautious and be this. And you imply that they will act like adults. They can't act like adults and learn at the same time, okay? They are also confused between their own concept of freedom and what is imposed on them of limits. How could they reconcile this on their own? They have to understand and we parents have to sit down and explain to them what is the benefit of limits, restrictions, which are not intended to limit them, it's intended to protect them against the potential harm that may befall them. They are also confused between Islamic values and personal desires. You know what? I want to do that, but you know, it's haram. You know, so how can I do it and, and, and not commit a sin, you know? Or how do I avoid committing a sin but get what I want? They need also to, lo to know and learn openly that everything that Allah has made prohibited, He substituted for it something halal that uh, you know, will come on time. It will come in due time for everybody. They are also confused between their desire for change and their own process of changing from childhood to youth to adulthood and stability. They value stability very much but they love to take risk and get adventures and uh, discover everything else. So these are some of the reasons and the reasons continue still. They are also confused between adults' claims of infallibility and perfection. I want to have the perfect child, uh, the straight A, the one who memorizes the whole Quran and even Bukhari and Muslim if possible. And adults as humans. If, 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 if you look at yourself when you were their age, you will appreciate the struggle they are putting and the achievements they are making and recognize the changes that they are going through. Uh, they are also struggling between education and certification. What does math have to do with my life? You know, some kids ask. You know, what do I use geography with? You know, and neither parents nor teachers are taking the time to explain the practical value of what they are teaching. And this is a challenge for Muslim schools and for teachers to come forward and explain what is the value of chemistry for somebody who wants to work as a truck driver. <laughs> you know, what is the value of math for someone who just wants to work as a clerk or nurse? Uh, you have to bring something to bear to make sense to them. Challenging adults is something that, that is proud of their growth, but also uh, developing my space is something very desirable. Uh, between the desire for control, controlling the results and the situation and what happens next, and the desire to be independent, to act on my own without taking a huge uh, fallback as a result. Proving myself and personal failure, how to balance between the two. How can I prove myself without failing? And how can, can I uh, uh, ensure success while I am trying to take a risk and get something done new that I have never done before? Finally, we are struggling with our youth on all fronts just because of this upcoming list. What we want for our youth as parents and what they want for themselves. And this is a huge list uh, that can go on for hours, but just I made a brief one for you here. Our desire for control uh, contravenes their desire for freedom. Our desire for uh, their total submission to our authority contravenes their desire for independence. Uh, our desire for absolute obedience is also contrary to their desire for convincing reasons as to why they have to do what we tell them to do. Our desire for ensured, secured results 
We want to make sure that you're not going to have an accident. We want to make sure that you're not going to get an F. I want to make sure that your friends are not going to suck you into problems. I want to ensure all the results. And their desire for adventure, taking risks, and developing new skills. Desire for total discipline that we request of our children and their desire for a space for themselves. Our desire for total accountability. I want to make sure that you report to me about everything you do or not do and their desire for some tolerance, that they are not held to an angelic, unreasonable, untenable standards. Our desire for immediate compliance, I want you to do it, and when I say it, I want it done and finished, and their desire to have time to grow and mature. Uh, these are uh, some of the basic issues that relate to youth as an age group. And I hope that by going through the list, which I did very quickly for the sake of time, you have developed some sense of what it takes to mature, nurture, and grow my child from a young child who's very completely submissive and obedient to a, an independent young man who can make decisions, who can take risks without you know, necessarily failing under your guidance, ha who can have some independence, but also respect adults and relate to them in the appropriate way. Balancing all of this together is what this is about. Wallahu alam. Jazakallah khair. Yes, they, they, they overlap because you can't really separate one from the other. I'm challenging the adults to establish my independent, uh, assertive will of myself. And I am trying to get myself space which will give me independence, right? And to stay away from adults, I'm secluding myself to reflect and ponder on things on my own. Uh, I'm not joining adults in everything they want me to join because I want to be my own man. They all interfere and overlap. That's part of talking about any human traits or activities, they tend to overlap. Does it also perhaps uh, reflect their confusion? Sometimes they it, want something. It plays into their confusion. It plays into their fear of openness. As I said, they, they become very scared to be vulnerable because we adults have sharp tongues when it comes to criticizing our children, okay? And uh, we, 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 we don't have uh, enough vocabulary to encourage and support and express compassion and empathy and so on and so forth. They are afraid of us. Yes? I, it's, uh, I guess it's difficult to address solutions to every situation with, with the children at, at different ages and age groups. <coughs> so where can we read up on, on this or what can we um, how can we follow up, you know, have you got any books that you've written, any things we can... You will get the answer to this question the next session. Because the next session talks about how to deal with the youth. Considering all of these factors, we, I've developed about 30 bullet points that take you from the beginning to the end, how to deal with youth at your home uh, in varieties of situations. Besides that, have you, is there anything we can... I have not uh, written uh, books, no. I, every time I do this workshop... Yeah, <laughs> yeah? Inshallah, inshallah. Maybe on my way back. <laughs> I have 24 hours, yes. Yes, uh, I, I would just like to thank you, brother, for the presentations. I just want to highlight that the, the Muslim Youth As Association that you have talked about, because uh, my background is from Bahrain, mm -hmm. uh, and we, we have also progressed something similar, Muslim Youth Association, which, uh, which has about six places, or six different mm -hmm. uh, places in, throughout Bahrain, about for 2,000 people. Mm -hmm. so, uh, it started from about 20. Mm. Mm. So I want to address that this idea could be taken by FAMSI and uh, applied here. Yes. It, do, it, it does not need a lot, need a lot of money. Right. But when you do it at the beginning, you will get a lot of people coming to you. Right. You in Sydney, we have uh, probably three youth centers already established. But we need more in Chalva, so there's a lot more work that can be done. Any other questions? Yeah. The ladies have any questions? No questions. Everything clear? They are tired after lunch. After lunch they are tired.
Do you want to get some tea and coffee for five minutes? You okay? Okay, yeah. you can ask questions related to the previous presentations as well. Because we didn't have a chance to have enough questions and answers to the previous uh, two presentations. Um, yes. You mentioned something about um, schooling, the nature of the police, as well as um, uh, if you can elaborate on decent schooling and the education system. Hmm. That yeah. Yeah, what, what I mean here is the closer the school becomes to the home value and the home system of discipline, the more supportive the school becomes to the home uh, uh, nurturing and, and process of raising children. So what I mean by this in school is a school that, that stands in support of the home values because uh, one of the biggest challenges that we as parents always face is the challenge of having our children measure the world with our own yardstick. I'll give you an example. Two kids come home and one of them says, Mom, and I think I heard that, that question uh, sometime today but from somebody. Mom, uh, uh, no, it was on the radio uh, yesterday. Anyway, it says, she says, Mom, uh, do you know what? Uh, I go to the Muslim school and they are all Muslim kids and stuff, but do you know what? They, are, they don't pray really five times a day, okay? Why, why do we pray five times a day? And the other kid that comes and says, she's in the same setting, and she comes and says, Mom, you know, uh, we pray five times a day, but why aren't the rest of the kids in my school praying five times a day? The two kids are asking the same exact question. But one of them, the first one is asking, challenging the home, why burden me with a five-time daily prayer regimen, right? When other kids have the freedom to pray when they will, right? The other kid is saying, you know, the other kids are at fault. We pray five times a day, which we should. Why aren't they praying when they should? So uh, carrying the home-based values and the home yardstick as my measurement of what is right and what is wrong is the sign of success for the home. When the school becomes reflective of the same values and supportive of the home, that doesn't create any conflict. This is what I mean by a decent school. A school, even an, an Islamic school, that works with the home to nurture one direction for the kids. Uh, and this can only happen when all the parent body uh, is involved in the school development process. Not only a few parents, not only uh, a few board members. So, uh, but also a decent school is a school, the minimum of which is, it does not contravene what I'm doing at home. So I say, this is haram, they say, this is very good, right? When I say, you cannot do this, then they say, you must do that. That becomes contravention. So, uh, uh, what I meant is, there's a minimum that the school shouldn't be fighting the home, but better yet, if the school is supportive of the home value. Does this answer the question? Yes, yeah, so if the school, the Islamic school, as well as the state school, does not meet the parents' expectations, what alternatives are there for the parents? Uh, it's not about alternative. You may want to ask, what should the parents do? Because not everything can be solved by alternative stuff. We don't have so many alternatives as a minority here anyway. So what the parent should be doing is to get engaged, to engage the school in discussion, to engage the parent in the school in discussion, to drive their values into the school system, and to attend occasions, to volunteer in the school, to be part of the teacher aid system, so that you get aware, first-hand information as to what is going on. You get the chance to have a say with the principal. You get a chance to have a say with the PE teacher. You get a chance to join them in a field trip and thus influence what goes on in your own child's life. So you become partner instead of staying out and looking for another place to escape from where you are. So I believe that parent engagement is the key to the whole process, whether it is an Islamic school or a public school. What about the situation where a Muslim school does not encourage or support parent engagement? And in fact, where they start leaving those particular parents as troublemakers? I cannot speak, and, uh, for me this is a vague
presentation, I'm sorry, this is a vague presentation and I can't presume that this will tell me enough information to talk either about the school or the parent because it really focuses and depends on the style of communication between the parent and the school. Uh, parents should have a lot of power and especially in community supported schools. Parents should have a lot of power and say in what goes on in the school. And if this structure doesn't exist, parents have to fight to bring about that structure. Yes? What about the difference between the parents itself? One parent wants one way and the other parent wants the other way. Then the school wins. <laughs> Whenever there is a conflict, the third party wins. So parents have to sit down and be rational and say, let us agree that there is a minimum that everybody should agree to. What is this minimum? Then we say, children shouldn't be allowed to use foul language in the school premises. Children should not be allowed to curse each other. Children should not be allowed to cross certain limits. This is at least a decent limit that everybody should agree to. I'm just throwing an example. But when it comes to higher values, like how much committed a child could be or how much Quran would a child memorize, or this is individual family uh, uh, activity. This has nothing to do with the school. The school is not made to meet individual expectations of parents, but collective expectations of parents. So parents have to sit down in the PTA or PTO, whatever you call it, and, and develop those expectations from the school and relate them to the administration and demand that those expectations are met. But if parents disagree, the school wins always, and the kids lose. Uh, that would reflect on something different. That is the parental policy in raising kids. This is an issue that I wanted to bring to your attention, but we're talking very fast for the sake of time. Uh, every two parents at home must develop three things. Number one, a joint idea of what their children really are. You know, you say, for example, no, 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 y you misunderstand him. He, was, he didn't mean this, he meant that. How could the mother know what the father doesn't? How could she be the interpreter for the child? Is it because she lives with him longer? Is it because she is more empathetic and sympathetic to a situation? Is it because her perception is, if the father gets his way, he will be too harsh on the child and she wants to protect the child? These are all reasons for why mothers and fathers talk differently about kids. So number one, they have to see the kids with the same eye. They have to agree. This child of mine, yes, he is this, he is that, he is not this, he is not that. Then you develop the profile, what I call the child's profile, which is unique to every child. This is number one. Number two, they have to jointly develop a program of development to say, this is what we need to target with this child. He lacks reading. And he is bad in math. Last year he put, you know, graded poorly on math and stuff. And he also is not as polite as he should with his teachers. So these are three weaknesses that we want to focus on that particular child. As far as the girl, she is weak in this, she is strong in that. So, so you develop a program of development for each child. Then the third issue is a joint policy of both discipline and punishment, a joint policy, so that whenever something happens, they see it eye to eye, they know whether it is within the program or outside the program, and they know how to address it jointly. This whole joint idea is not there in many homes, I believe, in most of our homes. Parents do not see things eye to eye because we don't sit down to discuss and when we sit, we argue, we want to convince one another, we don't want to see things from the other person's perspective. And this is what we need to do. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes. When a child has been brought up in an Islamic school and then comes that they're into a university, secular university, mm -hmm. they become challenged like, to the full exposure of the whims of Western civilization. Mm -hmm. like, what does one do in that situation to support? The, the question assumes one assumption that I disagree with that that living through and growing up in an Islamic school doesn't expose you to secular values. It does. 
Islamic schools are not necessarily, quote unquote, a pure religious institutions. They are also secular institutions. They discuss civics, right? They discuss politics, they discuss geography, they discuss history, they discuss current events. So they are not totally, quote unquote, excluded from what's going on in the world. Second, kids also watch TV. So how could you call them isolated from society? They will watch TV, whether you like it or not, right? I'm not saying give in to that, but I'm saying they watch TV. I let my kids watch TV, but they watch the news, documentaries, and specific programs that can help them grow and understand the world around them, okay? Not only that, they also have friends in the Islamic schools who are not, quote unquote, as religious as themselves. So rest assured, they are really exposed to all varieties of people, and when they get to the college, we've seen them. They are the most active kids in the MSA, in FAMSI, are the ones who come from Islamic schools. I don't know if this is true or not in Australia, but uh, in, in the United States, the most active kids in MSA and the most efficient ones are the ones who come from Islamic schools. Why? They have clear perception of their identity. They have some direction as to where they want to go. And they can tell the difference between living as a Muslim and being left out in the open without any identity or central issue in your life. So they have a sense of mission and a sense of direction, uh, much better than ones who grew up in uh, the, uh, the general grazing area of the public school. OK, yes, yes. In your opinion, what, uh, what is the disadvantage of home education? What is the disadvantage of? Teaching your children to an institution to be To homeschool them? Uh, in homeschooling? I have seen and I have known children who have done their PhD, uh, who grew up from homeschooling. And they have done their PhD. They are very successful. They are very good. Uh, but those are individual cases. I do, not, I do not know of a study that would document uh, anything but that there is a social disadvantage for kids who study uh, at homeschooling, especially if they are not uh, accorded a chance to interact with other kids and to go out in the open to have field trips like other kids and to go and get exposed to the society. There, is, there are studies to prove that there is a social disadvantage, okay? But only if those factors are not included and incorporated in the program. If they are, the studies do not show any negative uh, impact on their social abilities and social skills. What's at home schooling? Homeschooling is when, when the parents do not send their kids to school, but they teach them at home. Uh, most of the time they get two or three parents. One is good in this subject, the other is good in that subject, and they collaborate together and get five, six kids, like a private tutoring. It's legally unacceptable. It's another option for the Muslim community. Okay. Yes. You mentioned the Arabic language. I think you spoke about the last one. You mentioned it was in one of the slides, the Arabic language. Yes. The, the Arabic language and how important this is. You know that your trust and confidence in any piece of information depends on several things. But one major factor is the authenticity of the source and the completeness of what you get. Okay? So when you get anything, you want to check always, is it first-hand source or second-hand source? Right? Translation is always a second-hand source of information. Anything translated, it gets filtered in the process through the eyes and ears and perceptions of the translator and the interpreter. So the question for us and our kids is, do we want our children to get Islam from second-hand sources? That's the bottom line question. It is not about glorifying the Arabic language or the Arabs or anything like this. It is not even about Arabic being the language of paradise. Because you use language here. When we get there, it's another situation. Okay? So people don't have to, to leave their you know, Malay background to get into paradise. Malays also will get to paradise. Inshallah. So what I'm saying is, you have to focus on what works here. And for them to be able to read the Quran, read interpretation, and read the fiqh, which is basically 
the primary sources are in Arabic. Anything else is a second-hand source. So the bottom line question for me is, do you want? And if you say, but what is wrong? You know, this is the language they master. It's English. And the whole world speaks English today, right? That's okay, but uh, if you do this, you are depriving their own children from getting to know Arabic altogether, maybe including the Quran. And this is what the West is counting on. They are counting on assimilation through depletion. It is not assimilation through voluntary acceptance or vo voluntary integration. They are talking about assimilation through depletion. Uh, the first generation will die, and the resources will go away, and the interest will fade away. And even, even if we teach our kids everything that we know, 100% of it, which is literally impossible, that you can teach your kids everything you know, right? They will only pick of it about 60 to 70% maximum. What will they retain, however, is not going to be 100% of what they receive. It will be much less. Now, take it to the second generation and the third generation, and assimilation becomes evident. So unless the first generation pays enough attention to what is central, to keeping the religion, keeping the identity of people, keeping the knowledge, you know, we are very much bent in the West on getting an imam that speaks English, an imam that speaks this. We should be bent on an imam that is interested in teaching our kids full Islam with the language. That's what we should be interested in. But we are spending more time satisfying our own desires as adults, much more than addressing the needs of our children as far as education in particular and the language in specific. Okay, any? Just, can you refer to the aspects of education like uh, uh, law and, and finance and secular? When he, he said that it's not all Islam. When, when they yeah, say, yeah, I refer to what is going on in Islamic school. Is is well, uh, what I was saying is they are not deprived of the secular aspect of education in Islamic schools. It is not. Is it, is it uh, secular? Like, Secular as opposed to Islamic. Yes, uh, yes, yes. I am saying kids who graduate from Islamic schools are partially exposed to secular education as they are exposed to Islamic education. I That's think what the mother is uh, saying is that, that even that education itself would be considered Islamic in the comprehensive use of the word Islamic. If, you took, if you're doing politics and geography and mathematics, and it's a benefit to the people, and that would be considered Islamic knowledge as well. Right. But this is theoretical. I was addressing, I'm sorry, I was addressing the issue that the brother was saying, that if kids graduate from Islamic schools, they will be dysfunctional in the college, because the college, by nature, is un-Islamic, it's focused on secular teachings and stuff. And I was answering to him saying, they are not purely, quote-unquote, Islamic. That, that's what brought the issue in. Okay, now that we've got to know something about children and their nature, something about youth and their nature, and something about the environment and its impact and influence, how do we then deal with our youth in particular? Uh, as I said before, I've developed certain things for you kind of like take home issues, okay? Things to understand, things to avoid, and things to do, okay? The first thing that we need to understand is that youth are neither children nor adults. So this is basically a recap of what we have been saying in, in brief summary. Also, youth is a developmental stage. It is not stagnant. So if you see something, 
that is nagging, disturbing, and annoying to you in your 14-year-old, wait one month or one year. It will go away so long as you persist and keep tackling the issue in the appropriate way. Youth have needs, desires, and wants. And we have to work with them as to what is appropriate and what is not, how to achieve uh, their needs, and how to satisfy their desires in the appropriate way, and when and how to postpone some of those until time comes to fulfill them. Youth are extra sensitive. So we have to be sensitive. We have to be, in fact, extra sensitive when we talk with them. Youth prefer space over interest. They prefer to have their own space much more than achieving something good for them. Okay? They, uh, adults are not always right. Sometimes we are wrong. And we have to recognize this and deal with it. Every teenager is a different person. You can't say, oh, when your brother was your age, he did this. It doesn't matter. Okay? Okay, these are things to understand, things to do. Accept youth as a transitional stage. Let me see if I missed something. Okay. Sorry for that. Accept youth as a transitional stage, okay? Which means you keep looking for what is to come and you keep benefiting from what, how you achieved where you are and look back at lessons learned. You keep evaluating the progress in their life as they transition from children to adults. Determine your child's character traits. As I mentioned, the child's profile. What works for him, what doesn't, and so on and so forth. Determine your goals for him or her. What are the weaknesses? What are the strengths? What do you want this child to be or do? And then specify how to deal with every quality that you determine in their profile. What to nurture and develop and push forward and what you try to change. Determine everyone's needs and wants. And these are not the same. They may need something that they overlook and as such they don't want it but they need it so you have to be able to determine for them what their needs really are to deal with each according to their own nature not according to your imagination of them to help them define goals and plans youth will not accept ready-made plans to tell them take this and go ahead and do it you have to bargain you have to Discuss, discuss, you have to convince, uh, give them love, support, and encouragement so that they can continue to sustain the relationship as one of love and compassion, not just one of control and discipline and punishment. Now, things to avoid. Number one, never bribe youth to do things. He can't pay them enough. So you have to convince them. You cannot manipulate them. Number two, never talk down to youth. Because you do that and they understand that you're talking down to them. Okay, and they hate it, they don't like it. Uh, never underestimate their abilities, their skills, their knowledge, and their desire to do things. Never challenge any angry youth. When they are angry, do not corner them further absorb balance between bringing your anger to add it to theirs. This becomes uh, very explosive for both of you. Never ignore their feelings when they take side or when they exclude themselves because they are not happy for something. Don't say, you know what, hit the wall. Don't do that. You have to approach, you have to reach out to them. Never criticize them in public. Never break a promise without a good reason. When you say, I, I will do this, never break your promise without providing good explanation. Despite all of that, conflict will happen. 
right? Parents and kids are bound to conflict just because they are different. Just because they are different generations, coming from different perspectives, looking at different interests, wants, desires, needs, and things to care about. So conflict will happen. How then do I manage or resolve a conflict with my children? First, do not rush to judgment or decisions. Whenever a conflict arises, never come up with your final conclusion before the discussion has ever started. Okay? Don't say, I know you. You've always done this. Because that breaks the whole thing of opening a discussion. Decide if time is fit for discussion. Not every time there is a conflict that the time is ripe and good for discussion at the moment. Maybe you want to leave it for some other time. Maybe you want to leave it for a day or two. Sometimes they reflect on their own and come back and say, you know what, I was wrong. Okay? Mutually define the issue at hand. You know what? When I told you that you need to come before Maghrib, I said this for a reason. And when you come right after Isha, two hours later, don't you think that this disturbs me as a, as a father? It sure does. Yeah, but but uh, you know, uh, my friends were late and uh, I had to drop them off because one of them had a flat tire and stuff. Then the answer is, call me. Let me know that you're late. So, and instead of challenging, give them the exit. Next time, I want you to call me. Could you have done something different? Okay, so and instead of cornering and pushing, you give them a way around the situation. Keep the focus on what is important. And instead of discussing all the problems that the, the, the person has in, in their life, just bring the issue that you're talking about and focus on it. If it is about being late, let it be about being late. Don't talk about the flat tire uh, mechanic and this. Company. Yeah, don't bring all issues on the table at the same time. Focus on what is important for you at the time because kids cannot take cumulative stacked problems. They think that you're just stacking the deck against them to, to render them guilty of anything. Define principles governing the situation. Tell them, did we agree that you should be here before Maghrib? Oh, but, but did we agree that you should be here before Maghrib? You have to get them to recognize that there is a principle at stake here. Okay? And then you can be lenient about anything else. Define the start, the cause, and the reaction. How did the problem start? Did it start with them playing chess or watching a movie that took longer than needed? Or did it start because actually the flat tire happened? Or because one of them wanted to drop by a store and they got delayed and stuff? So you have to determine where did the problem start so that you can put your hand on what is wrong and then follow the trace of the developments. Assure them of love and commitment. Because this is an essential element of good communication. That you are communicating out of love and care. Because most of us, when we communicate with our kids in conflict situations, we communicate out of fear. And fear does not bring the best out of us. Love does. So focus your motive on love, not fear. Promise the least penalty if he is taking responsibility. Say, you know what, I just want you to tell me how would you handle the same situation if it happens tomorrow. This will lead to taking responsibility. I'm going to call you, I'm going to make sure that the car has gas and oil and stuff. I'm just using this as an example. Then agree to correction and future approach to the same problem. For example, if he says, you know what, I'm going to pay for the flat tire. That's fine. Okay? Or I'm going to give up my next weekend trip with them. I'm not going with them. That is an acceptable <coughs> resolution as well. Keep the dialogue channels always open. Don't say, since this happened, I don't feel like talking to him. You must be talking to him all the time. Keep your cool throughout the discussions because you are the adult in charge and in control. So if you lose your temper, then it's bound to explode between the two of you. Use the broken record as needed. Repeat what is the principle at stake. Keep repeating it until it sinks. 
keep saying, all what I am saying is, I want to make sure that you were safe. I want to make sure that nothing wrong happened to you. I care about you. I know, I know. But I want you to understand that that's all what this is about. It's about me caring about you. It is not about trust or distrust. It is not about you being responsible. It is about me caring about you. Defer to the motive of love over fear. We spoke about this just a minute ago. That love brings positive emotions, sympathy, empathy, understanding, and the like. Acknowledge mistakes when appropriate. Yeah, it was my mistake. I forgot to put oil in the car when I handed it to you. I was supposed to change the oil, but I didn't. So the engine broke down, it's my mistake. Don't lump sum everything on the shoulder of the youth. Uh, maintain a positive atmosphere at home. Let, let everybody feel comfortable to talk. Let everybody feel comfortable to be vulnerable, to be wrong, to be uh, open with everything that happens. Make a contract if needed. It's not strange that parents would make a real contract with their children that if I do this next time, this will be the results. This will be the consequences. Uh, and they understand that there must be consequences for things. Okay. Is this such a thing, enjoying the company of your teenager? Of course. Of course. Teenagers are the most lovable creatures on earth. Because they combine, as we mentioned, believe me, they combine, as we mentioned, the innocence of children and the thinking of adults and the attitudes that come in between the two of them. So they are really joy, provided that we recognize at the time they behave in a certain way, where they are coming from, then and only then we can enjoy it as is. But if we take everything they do and measure it with an angelic yardstick, we will fail ourselves. So we have to adjust our own yardsticks. Accept responsibility for your children. Whatever teenager you have at home, it is the child that you yourself grew up not anybody else. So don't blame his mistakes on him. Take responsibility, at least partially, and move with this. Agree with your spouse on one policy. We explained this before, right? Raise your children to love Allah, to love the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and to love the Quran. Children who grew up with the Qur'an are totally different than children who grew up not knowing what the Qur'an is really about. And this is central in this whole if, uh, issue. That uh, if you let Allah speak directly to the kids and you become the facilitator, it is totally different from you trying to be God on earth for the children. Should I repeat this again? If you adapt the role of the facilitator, making Allah lovable to your children and you only facilitate Allah's access to your child and your child's access to Allah and instead of trying to be God on earth on top of your children these are two opposite attitudes let me tell you where I'm coming from you read in Surah Luqman uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us that Luqman spoke to his child. What did he say? He said, Ya Bunaya, O my son, La tushrik billah. Associate no partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Immediately right after, what does the Quran say? Wa wassayna al insana biwalidayh. Right? Likewise, wa qada rabbuka alla ta'abudu illa iyyah. And immediately, wa bil. Walidaini ihsana. What is the relationship here? Can somebody help me with this? Why why is this combination? Why is it that Allah who doesn't like any partners, any associates, says Anishkurli wali wali daika? Why? You can say all you have in the world that parents are important, parents are the ones who do that. But but there is one reason that Surah Luqman is pointing out. The link between God and parents, um, did the children, the parents, 
That is true. The message in Surah Luqman, thank you sister, the message in Surah Luqman says something uh, very important. That is, if you the parent deliver your children to Allah in submission, He will deliver them back to you in obedience and kindness. You get this? If you focus your role on delivering your children to Allah, you need not to worry about them being kind to you. This will come, and it will come as part of their worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will not struggle to do it. They will do it and do it naturally. Okay? So, this is exactly the opposite of trying to be God on earth, enforcing the rules and insisting on this, fighting the kids to make them in your image. Instead, push them kindly towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like inviting in America, uh, we have a saying, I don't know if you have the same thing, uh, you can take the horse to the water, but you cannot force them to drink, <laughs> right? And if you do, you end, you end up drowning them, right? So you have to bring your kids closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and help them know how kind and merciful and compassionate Allah is. He is the best of company. He is with you all the time. He is the one who gave you this, gave you that. He is the one who took care of you when you were young. He is the one who's going to take care of you when you get old. He is the one who provides. If, if Allah becomes uh, settled in the heart of the child, there is little education needed to give them information and they will go with it on their own. It becomes an automatic pilot. Not necessarily, there is nothing called automatic when it comes to raising children. But at least it becomes much easier than fighting on every issue, on every corner, every turn. Huh? As a catalyst. Yeah, the parent as a catalyst is... is I mean, yes, that, that also is true. So let's go back here. Um, establish a regular family study circle. How many of us sit down with their kids around the Quran and the Hadith and the Sunnah on daily basis? Okay, how about once a week? Once a week, how many? Can I have a show of hands? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, fathers do not sit with the kids at all. How about uh, twice a month? Okay, so you see where we are missing. We are missing that the biggest investment in our life is not getting a minute of our time. How, how, could, we, how could we raise, and when do we raise Muslim children? If we don't give them time. So this becomes a very essential issue. Then always remind them of Allah death and the hereafter. There was a question about uh, from somebody, uh, I think if it is not today, yesterday, about talking about death with young children. Huh? Yesterday? yesterday. Yeah. Uh, you have to be careful. When do you start talking about death with young children? Uh, with young children, uh, we always prefer positive enforcements, not negative enforcements. Uh, positive enforcements to talk about paradise, to talk about positive things, to talk about rewards, to talk about being with the prophets, being with the companions that he read about, to talk about something positive to motivate them. Because if you scare them at young age and they don't know how to translate this into something, they end up becoming kind of depressed and it becomes perplexing for them. So you have to be careful when to use death. Uh, uh, talk with them about yourself, your concerns, hopes, and even fears. Because it shows your trust in your teenage. I'm not talking about young children here. I'm talking about teenage. Okay. Then, I think this is final. Uh, get your home a good library for adults, for children, and for teenagers. 
respect and value their feelings and views. Never mock them, never be sarcastic about what they say, and never humiliate them or insult them. Explain why you see things the way you do. Keep their secrets. When they give you something in confidence, keep it. Because you break that trust and it's very difficult to rebuild it. Be fair and be just to all of them. Accept the positive change in their behavior, which means you have to monitor their development. And whatever positive that you see in their behavior, you keep acknowledging it to reinforce the development of positive behavior. Fill their time with planned activities as much as you can, but plan it with them as we mentioned before. Join them in positive activities, take them go walking, biking, hiking, trips, camps. I was wrong, I was missing this one. Consult with your teenagers on issues of concern. Give them some house responsibilities. Deal with them as brothers and sisters. Stay in touch with your child and his school. Listen carefully to anything they say. Anything means anything because sometimes they give you subtle messages. And when you get letter to say, you didn't tell me, no, no, I told you this. That's what I meant. So pay attention to anything they say at any time. Uh, emphasize the love for the sake of Allah as the backbone of your relationship with them. Meet their reasonable expectations as much as you can. And finally, always make dua for them all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of our children and guide us to be the best parents we can. Jazakumullah khair. I have two uh, written questions. The first one is, as a divorced mother uh, with uh, kids and um, the, the, the divorced father, has a different, uh, different level of thinking. On different the approach, what yes. Does, what does the mother do? The divorced mother of the children. I understand. And the, there are two. With the, with the father. If the kids are living, see, this is what the law says in the States that the parent holding the custody establishes the rules, and the other parent supports them. And I find wisdom in that. And I think that Islamic law would provide for the same thing, that the parents who holds custody of the children should, if there are differences in policies and ways and means, the reference is the one who is holding custody of the children. Okay, and the, the, the parent who doesn't should be convinced that this is for the best interest of the children. Okay, then the question is, how about when he has them or when she has them? Should they change the policy? The answer is no. They should keep the policy because it provides for stability, consistency, and it's good for the kids. So the, 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 uh, if there is any need, the sister needs to get all the needs she can, the help that she needs from the community to establish that direction, that the father would agree at least they can agree to things that they can agree to. If they can agree on 10 points, if they agree to seven, that's fine. Okay, but then he has to give in to the three that she insists that are better for the child, unless the mediating party can convince her otherwise. So, so both parents should agree on a policy uh, for the kids. Yes, but if they are separated and if they are in disagreement yeah. over the policy, mediation then me mediation should come in. But the primary issue is if mediation doesn't succeed to reconcile between the two, then the policy of the custodian parent should hold. But that's not going to result in the father, for example, if he does not endorse the, uh, uh, the policy. He, he has custody of the, the children, not uh, enforcing it. He has to understand that this is going to ruin... Uh, first of all, it's counterproductive, because the kids will manipulate both parents. They will go one way and say one thing, and they go the other way and say the other thing. Okay, so this is counterproductive. Number two, it teaches hypocrisy, as if there are two religions. One, the Islam of the mother, and the second is the Islam of the father. And that's untrue. Islam has a minimum criteria that everybody should abide by. 
So there is, this is a fault in, 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 in having two policies anyway. The third uh, uh, difficulty is that the kids themselves will develop more confusion and more hatred to one of the two parents who is the disciplinarian. And why Islam would support the legal policy of the United States in that direction, that the custodian parent holds uh, the grounds to the policy, is basically because the child will have to develop some level of trust of what he has to be dealing with in terms of discipline. So the mother has the kids for seven, for five days, and the father gets the kids over the weekend. Then if the mother is the one that has to discipline the children, she will have to suffer everything because she will be the one saying no, 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 no. And the father will take them to the park, will take them to the movie, will do this, will do that. And he becomes the, 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 the honeymoon and she becomes like hellfire. And that's, that's unfair and unrealistic. Or the opposite for that matter. Okay, so uh, there is a good reason for the Sharia of Islam that the, the custodian parent should establish the policy and the other parent should cooperate. The next question is, uh, uh, is the fight for independence with teenagers saying that they, they don't want to go with their parents, for example, is this at all acceptable? Uh, are there any ways to change their attitudes? Can you repeat the first part of the question? They fight for independence. Mm -hmm. uh, are there ways to change their attitudes? So that they don't. So that. So that they don't seek independence. Um, the example was when teenagers say that they don't want to go with their parents, for example. Right, for a visit or something. Yeah. Okay. Well, basically, this is part of the bargaining process that goes on between parents and teenagers. Uh, your teenagers do not develop uh, an abrupt kind of attitude all of a sudden overnight. They come with it and they show little signs of resentment over a period of time. So you have to monitor those signs when they are 8 years old, 9 years old, 10 years old, and 11, and then they start saying, you know, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this. You have to monitor those, uh, yes, early on and track what do they really reflect. Is it just the innocent desire of being independent or is it hatred of the authority of the parent or is it hatred of control of the parent or is it hatred of the family that we want to visit and their kids are nasty and stuff like this? What exactly it is? Because as I said in the beginning, Al-Hukm ala shay fara'an tasawwara. Before you judge anything, you have to dig a little bit deeper to know where they are coming from. Once you decide this, you are able to deal with it. But you have to analyze and sort out the kind of behavior and motives behind the behavior first. Now the question is, but if the child nevertheless comes and says, I don't want to go with you, it's a matter of parental decision. If you feel that it is safe to leave, the, to leave them home, okay, that's fine, leave them home. They are not going to kill themselves. Yeah, don't make a big deal about it, but talk about it until you are comfortable that they are not going to do something nefarious in your absence. Any other questions? <coughs> yes, to actually, you actually raised a couple of points, uh, at least the point about the fathers not being available. In a situation, uh, I'm not sure about other fathers, but in a situation where, say, for example, the, uh, there's a new family business or a new, you're starting a new business, or in some, in some um, uh, areas of work, let's say in IT, it's very demanding. Um, so, if, you know, especially if he's a programmer or whatever, he, he has to stay back late. He, he sometimes has to work on weekends. You know, if he's starting a new business, there's a lot of demand there. Right. It takes up a lot of his time. So, what can the father do, and how can he and the mother work together? Well, first of all, the father has to factor in the importance of his role in raising the children. Because if we give in to the idea that we fathers are too busy to raise our children because we're having a new business, that becomes like a cycle that feeds into itself. You know what, when I finish my graduate studies, do you know what, when I get a good job, do you know what, when I get a better job, do you know what, when I get my own business, now I can have my own time. Do you know what? Business is very time consuming. Do you know what? I'm dying. 
by the time you get there, they have already grown up, they don't need you. They need you the most when they need you. Okay? Okay, let me not be harsh, because I know that time is not on our side, all of us. I believe it is still a matter of trade-off. What do you want and for what price? How much business do you want and at what price do you want it? If the price is raising your kids, then this is too expensive. So look at it this way. How much am I willing to sacrifice to raise my kids? And is it good business for me? And how much business am I willing to make at the expense of my children? And the balance is schedule them in your life at least once a week. Okay? To sit down once a week to take them out. These are two uh, occasions that, that, that they need you. Okay? And if you cannot do that because of your business and stuff, then pick one of them every time, uh, once a week, to give them time to talk, to listen, to, to befriend them, and to get them to talk to you and stuff, so that they feel your existence in their life. But I believe it's much cheaper to sit with all of them all at once than have uh, you know, every one of them independently and separately. Although this has value and this has value. But it's a matter of balance. Uh, I've been going with many parents uh, having the problem is that they, uh, for each one of their sons or daughters, they give them their own privacy, yes. own belongings, and they and the parents always suffer because each one wants his. I mean, he has his own things. He has his own privacy. Yes. He, this yes. Is, and uh, we as parents, we always suffer from that fighting. And we don't know how to deal with it. And we, we try to make it more disciplined that each one has his own things. But at the end, they also they will still need the other stuff from, from their brothers and sisters. Uh, so I don't know what do I buy. Do we should we teach them so that they sh share everything from the beginning, or there's another way to stop the fighting? Well, uh, by nature and by the recognition of the nature of the human being, there are things that they cannot share. Uh, like their toothbrush and some stuff, okay? But there are things that they should share. So why make it one way or the other? It is not either or. Most of the choices we have in life are in the gray area, okay? So I believe we should focus on this. Uh, Islam teaches us, that when we eat, we try to eat all of us together, okay? From one plate if we can, to get the barakah and so on and so forth. Uh, the Western culture is much more focused on individualism, selfishness, control, power, and greed. Okay? We nurture those values in the hearts and minds of the kids when we, from the beginning, oh, this is your toy, this is his toy, this is your ball, this is his ball. What is next? This is your home and this is home? It doesn't work this way. Life is not about this. Life is as much about privacy and personal belongings as much as it is about sharing. And that is part of their growth and education. So we have to determine for them as parents what are the things where they have to share and what are the things that they have to have individually because this is something that cannot be shared. And this should be the line. Okay? One last question. No explanation, question. Uh, when you say fair and just, is there a difference between fair and just? Yeah. Fair, fairness is about trying to strike a balance. To be fair, trying to be fair. But justice, which is adl, is to do what is right no matter whether it strikes a balance or not. Like when the judge says, this is what it is, it doesn't matter what happens to the plaintiff, it doesn't matter what happens to the defendant. The judge is saying what he says as, what is just, okay? But fairness is a compromise that pleases everybody and doesn't necessarily achieve justice, but it achieves satisfaction. And normally in justice, you have one part, party uh, comes out feeling being treated fairly and the other party being treated unfairly. Well, yes, yes. That that also that also true. It's a matter of perception, because you could establish justice, but the perception of fairness and unfairness cannot necessarily be consistent with what you perceive as just. 
one's relative, one is relative. One is relative and what's absolute, in a way, in a way, yes. One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have and Seen Me Pray, Words, Ramadan, Renewal Next. of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims.